amendment now, and we will call the question on Mr. Turnbull's amendment. Mr. Fergus. Ms. Suds. In favor? Ms. Romanato. Four. Ms. Sahota. Four. Mr. Baker. In favor. Mr. Berthold. No. Mr. Barrett. No. Mr. Cooper. No. Mr. Nader. No. Madame Gaudreau. No. Mr. Julian. No. Opposé. Yes, pour five, nays, contre six. Okay. Um, I sometimes try to wait for the microphone to be turned on, and that's what was happening. I will come back to you, Mr. Cooper, as I said I would. Um, so, uh, Sophia, I want to thank you for calling that vote. The last time you called a vote, it was unanimous, and I was hoping for the same outcome, but not this time. Mr. Cooper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, given the filibustering that had taken place over nearly 20, a 24-hour period over four days, uh, my motion proposed that Ms. Telford uh, appear last week, and so uh, therefore, uh, given that that time has passed, I am now moving uh, an amendment to my motion that reads as follows, uh, that the motion be amended by replacing the words during the week of March 13th, 2023, with between Monday, April 3, 2023, and Friday, April 14, 2023. Any discussion? I'll be very brief, Madam Chair. Uh, the, this time frame recognizes that next week is Budget Week and uh, provides uh, a two-week window during the constituency uh, weeks that uh, this committee could convene and hear from Ms. Telford. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Any other comments on this? Mrs. Romanado? Madam Chair, just because we've had um, Ms. Blaney's motion that passed as amended, I just want to make sure it's very clear we have some substitutes on committee today. I'd like to make sure that we all have the right motion that Mr. Cooper is referring to. So is it possible to make sure that we all have what he's proposing circulated? Thank you. The amendment has been distributed. Sophia has confirmed. So why don't we just take a second to check up in our inboxes to see if it's been received. Um, Sophia, if we can perhaps have a printed copy. That'd be great. Shrink paychecks and higher taxes on gas, groceries, and heat. Why won't they cancel these tax hikes so that Canadians can keep a roof over their heads? The Honourable Minister can't even afford to have a family in the first place because they can't get out of their parents' basements or out of 400 square foot apartments after housing prices have literally doubled in this country under this Prime Minister. And now, with rising interest rates, which this government promised would not happen anytime soon, families have to spend 50 percent of their income just to keep a roof over their head, the highest in over three decades. And the solution from the Liberals? Higher taxes on gas, groceries, and paychecks. Will they follow the Conservative demand? My amendment? Yes, okay. please. Okay. That uh, the motion as amended by Ms. Blaney uh, be uh, amended by replacing the words during the week of March 13, 2023 with between March 
between Monday, April 3rd, 2023, and Friday, April 14th, 2023. That's what I was asking. So we have the amendment in front of us. Um, anyone want to discuss this? Mr. Fergus? Uh, Madam Chair, I, I will have another uh, amendment to offer in a moment uh, around uh, the minimum of two hours, but I think we should dispense with this first. Would you like to just from the amend this one because then it would this would change the date to a period and then the three hours if that's what you're changing we could just do it at the same time would there be a desire to have a friendly Just if there's enough, there's a lot, been a lot of confusion. We've had a lot of different uh, motions, amendments, sub amendments over uh, a period of time. I would suggest that we dispense with my amendment to the motion as amended, and then if Mr. Julian wishes to move an amendment, then we can yeah. deliberate that on that. Mr. Fergus, Mr. Fergus. I just want to uh, make sure I understand, Madam Chair, that that 
euh, because of the, I think, useful discussions which we've had around the table, parce qu'on a eu des discussions euh, très... We've had useful discussions ar around the table, fruitful ones too, so I just want to check through you or through the clerk, Madam Chairperson, that what Mr. Julian is going to move is in order. Yes. So if Mr. Julian wants to amend what Mr. Cooper has amended, now would be the time to do so. And since Mr. Julian is also going to amend something else, well, we can deal with that afterwards. All right. So on that, not seeing any hands, I'm going to call the question on Mr. Cooper's amendment. Mr. Fergus. Vote en favor. Ms. Suds. In favor. Ms. Romanado. Je vote en favor. Ms. Sahoda. Oui. Mr. Baker. In favor. Monsieur Berthold. Oui. Mr. Barrett. Yay. Yeah. Mr. Cooper. Support. Mr. Nader. In favor. Madame Gaudreau? We. Oui. Mr. Julian. It's unanimous, Madame. <laughs> yes, pour 11. Nays, contre, zero. The streak returns. <laughs> I don't know what happened last. You should have led to the clerk, the head clerk, to actually call the other one. Excellent. Uh, I see your hand up, Mr. Julian. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I think this. Uh, probably be the last amendment. Hopefully we'll be able to vote on the main motion. I would like to change um, after to appear to add for a minimum of two hours. Uh, so it would read, invite Katie Telford, Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister, to appear for a minimum of two hours by herself. Uh, and then that goes on to the amendment from Mr. Just Cooper. En français, ça sera pendant... In French, for a minimum of two hours to appear for a minimum of two hours. Inaudible. Can we, can, can we just let Mr. Julian finish what he's saying? We all listen, and then we get to jump in and have the debate on it. Would you I, like to I, repeat I what we you I, I finished, Madam Chair. Okay, so you are changing it to a minimum of two hours and for her to appear by herself. Well, no, it says it, I would change uh, to appear alone for three hours by herself to to appear for a minimum of two hours by herself. Okay. I'm going to take names and it's going to be Mr. Bertolt, est-ce que vous avez le vite? No. Mr. Cooper followed to potentially accept this is a friendly amendment. Okay. So I just want to confirm. We, this is not a friendly because we voted on yours. So this is a new amendment. No, no. So. Yes. Right. But it's, it's my motion. We voted on your amendment, Cooper. I'm going to have Mrs. Sohoda on the list, followed by Mrs. Romanado. Mrs. Sohoda. Okay. Um, I'm just going to make my comments first, and then perhaps Mr. Julian would see it as a friendly uh, amendment or sub-amendment to his amendment. Um, that the word by herself be removed. It is customary for there to be officials present um, when a witness um, like the chief of staff appears. So I would just ask Mr. Julian whether he would accept that as a friendly. If not, then I could, you know, explain a little further as to why um, and perhaps be formally then moving a sub amendment. Mr. Julian? I'm going to actually, would you like to answer Mr. Julian? Well, we, we'd be removing the word alone, at the superfluous, um, 
But there's so. two words like on either side of the yeah. <laughs> um, the request. Uh, it says to appear alone. Uh, you remove that, and then for a minimum of three hours, but then it's followed by minimum. two hours, sorry. Two hours. And then that's followed by herself. Like, it's, it's I don't know why it was ever worded that way, but I guess somebody really wanted to make that emphasis <laughs> that she be alone and be by herself um, at the same time. And so I think that neither, uh, both should be removed. So, Mr. Julian, would you like to accept that as a friendly amendment, or you don't see it as a friendly amendment? Uh, we've we've removed the word alone. I think that's sufficient for what um, Ms. Sohoda is speaking of. So, Ms. Sohoda is suggesting that by having her by herself, she does not have the ability to have her officials with her, and is suggesting that it would be more customary for someone to appear with officials. You're suggesting you want her by herself and not with officials. Uh, we have taken out uh, a loan um, and for a minimum of two hours. Uh, I don't see that as instructing her not to be with officials. Uh, well, I mean, officials are behind. She's consulting with them. That That is normal practice at committee. So I think there's a difference between um, officials being sat behind versus being at the table with you to be able to consult. I think that's the nuance. Uh, Mrs. Sohoda? So perhaps um, if, if removing by herself is not seen as a friendly amendment, perhaps I can suggest adding more words to it, say uh, she may be accompanied by, may or may not be accompanied by officials. I mean, it just, I think it'd be easier just to remove the by herself. Um, if you're not opposed to officials coming, then that is, she would be here. I think the point at the end of the day, everyone, like, uh, I think the whole point is to have Katie Telford appear. And that is what we've been talking about for a long time. Uh, we're making progress on making that happen. And so now it seems a little bit silly that uh, we're, we're struggling with, you know, with this wording. So I'm just going to go back before I go to Mrs. Romanato. Mr. Julian, it's your amendment. Do you see that as a friendly one or not? That's okay either way. I, I see uh, this with this amendment that uh, officials could accompany her and she could consult with them. That That is something that happens at committee. Okay, so then I'll move a sub-amendment. I, I. Mrs. Okay. Sahoda, in all honesty, if I can just use the conversation that the clerk and I just had, it's a public meeting. So if the deputy's in the room and somebody asks a question and they say, she says, I can, you know, my deputy's in the room, if you would like the deputy to elaborate, it's a public meeting. So technically, you could bring them to answer that question in a sense, like, if the person really wants the answer, the deputy could, we'd have to just agree to it. And if it, I think the person doesn't want the answer from the deputy, then that I think speaks to the person who doesn't want the answer from the deputy. Am I be, perhaps being too logical? I don't know. Mrs. Hoda looks concerned, so yes? No, I, I think it's good that we're having this conversation. It clarifies things. I, I, I like the perspective that, that you're giving and the reassurance that Mr. Julian seems to be providing that his intention is not to exclude officials from the meeting. Um, so as long as they're not excluded from being present, and, and is that my, am I correct in assuming that, Mr. Julian, that that's not your intention? I think the way the chair just spelled it out is, uh, is it's exactly what, what the committee would, would understand as well. Okay, thank, thank you. Mrs. Romanato. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and actually, I was going to just ask for the same clarity from Mr. Julian in terms of um, 
if uh, Ms. Telford would like to have officials with her, but you, we've already had that conversation, so that's fine. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Mr. Fergus. Um, just for the point of clarity, and then I, I will withdraw this, but or I will uh, I will move on. But uh, just to understand <coughs> what Mr. Uh, Mr. Julian's understanding, and perhaps all members' uh, understanding as well, is that if Mrs. Uh, Ms. Telford is here with uh, uh, officials uh, and to public meeting, they can they can be here. I get that. Um, would they? For my purposes, would I be able to, would they have a name tag and sitting at the table so I could at least know who they are and the role that they play? So what I would suggest is that let's say the witness was to say I would like my official to be able to elaborate and the member was suitable with it, yes, somebody would come and bring them a name tag because they'd be at the table to answer the question. They can't answer it from the back. So the minute you are at, seated at this table, yes, there is a name in front of you. I wasn't sure if you wanted to say something back, so that ends. Uh, good luck to the clerks on uh, having uh, name tags just ready and prepared to, uh, <laughs> to bring up to the table. And, and good luck to the analysts for providing us perhaps with a little bit of background uh, so that, you know, they can as they normally do provide us with some background beforehand as well. So I'm understanding that there is agreement that if officials are providing insights, I'm sure we can ask Ms. Telford to let us know who will be accompanying her in the room and then that way if there's a line of questioning, we are ready for the name tags and what they do. Does that provide some satisfaction? I tend to usually have some leniency to make sure that members are equipped for a successful meeting. I will use that leniency unless someone tells me I don't have it. We're good there? That would satisfy uh, me, Madam, uh, Madam Chair. Well, that's always a goal. So thank you, Mr. Fergus. Mr. Nader? Thank you, Mr. Nader. I am going to call the question on Mr. Julian's amendment. Um, and for the record, the amendment is the word alone, which is after appear to be removed, keep four, insert a minimum of two, remove three, and the rest reads until the next. A minimum of two, remove three hours. Yes. Okay. Mr. Fergus. Uh, uh, I vote uh, in favor. Ms. Suds? In favor. Ms. Romanado? A favor. Ms. Sahoda? Oui. Mr. Baker? In favor. Mr. Berthold? Oui. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Cooper? Favor. Mr. Nader? Favor. Madame Gaudreau? Oui. Mr. Julian? Unanimous again, Madame Chair. It's yes. Yes pour 11, nays contre 0. Thank you, Sophia. Unless there is conversation and discussion, I think we can go to the main motion as amended, as amended, as amended. We're okay with that, perfect. Um, and I'm not sure who's asking to you. On the main motion, as amended, Mr. Fergus. Je vote en faveur. Ms. Suds. In favor? Ms. Romanado. En favor. Ms. Sahoda. Yes. Mr. Baker. In favor. Mr. Bertod. Papa. Mr. Barrett. Yay. Mr. Cooper. Yes. Mr. Nader. In favor. Madame Gaudreau. Oui. Mr. Julian. Adopted unanimously, yes. Yes, 11, nays, count, zero. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, the motion as amended multiple times passes. Um, with that, I'm kind of hoping we can get an hour of our lives back, but does anybody else have something else to talk about? So I'm going to just give you a quick update on redistribution. We did, as was requested, send out a chart um, to show you just the breakdown of everything. And then we will have some conversations amongst colleagues and the subcommittee to figure out the way forward for redistribution, because maybe we can get to that next week as it is budget week. And then following that as the motion that's just passed, we would be setting up a time um, for Ms. Telford to come. The clerk uh, will reach out to find out her availability, and then we'll try to start working on some of that information so that we are prepped for that meeting accordingly. Excellent. Nodding of heads. Excellent. And with that, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Have a great day. Oh, I just want to confirm. We, this is not a friendly because we voted on yours. So this is a new amendment. Well, yeah. So. Yes. Right. It's my motion. We voted on your amendment, Cooper. I'm going to have Mrs. Sahoda on the list, followed by Mrs. Romanado. Mrs. Sahoda. Okay. Um, I'm just going to make my comments first, and then perhaps Mr. Julian would see it as a friendly uh, amendment or sub-amendment to his amendment, um, that the word by herself be removed. It is customary for there to be officials present um, when a witness um, like the chief of staff appears. So I would just ask Mr. Julian whether he would accept that as a friendly. If not, then I could, you know, explain a little further as to why um, and perhaps be formally then moving a sub amendment. Mr. Julian? I'm going to actually, would you like to answer, Mr. Julian? Well, we, we'd be removing the word alone, at the superfluous. Um, but there's so. two words, like, on either side of the, yeah. <laughs> um, kept the request. The it says to appear alone. Uh, you remove that, and then for a minimum of three hours, but then it's followed by two hours, sorry. Two hours. And then that's followed by herself. Like, it's, it's I don't know why it was ever worded that way. But I guess somebody really wanted to make that emphasis <laughs> that she be alone and be by herself um, at the same time. And so I think that neither, uh, both should be removed. So, Mr. Julian, would you like to accept that as a friendly amendment, or you don't see it as a friendly amendment? Uh, we've we've removed the word alone. I think that's sufficient for what um, Ms. Sohoda is speaking of. So, Ms. Sohoda is suggesting that by having her by herself, she does not have the ability to have her officials with her, and is suggesting that it would be more customary for someone to appear with officials. You're suggesting you want her by herself and not with officials. Uh, we have taken out uh, a loan um, and for a minimum of two hours. Uh, I don't see that as instructing her not to be with officials. Uh, well, I mean, officials are behind. She's consulting with them. That That is normal practice at committee. So I think there's a difference a between um, officials being sat behind versus being at the table with you to be able to consult. I think that's the nuance. Uh, Mrs. Sohoda? So perhaps um, if, if removing by herself is not seen as a friendly amendment, perhaps I can suggest adding more words to it, say uh, she may be accompanied by, may or may not be accompanied by officials. I mean, it just, I think it'd be easier just to remove the by herself. Um, if you're not opposed to officials coming, then that is, she would be here. I think the point 
at the end of the day, everyone, like, uh, I think the whole point is to have Katie Telford appear. And that is what we've been talking about for a long time. Uh, we're making progress on making that happen. And so now it seems a little bit silly that uh, we're, we're struggling with, you know, with this wording. So I'm just going to go back before I go to Mrs. Romanato. Mr. Julian, it's your amendment. Do you see that as a friendly one or not? That's okay either way. I, I see uh, this with this amendment that uh, officials could accompany her and she could consult with them. That, that is something that happens at committee. Okay, so then I'll move a sub-amendment. We make sure that our supply chain is more internal and without having a huge impact on the cost to, to consumers because that is also a big issue. How can we have more resilience and more local production to make sure that we can improve labor conditions for the workers who are uh, affected by the uh, supply chain? We know that here and abroad there are difficult conditions for workers. Thank you. Honourable Member for Windsor West. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate my colleague and his work on our committee where this actually uh, rights and um, uh, a fair balance is, uh, you know, is part of his regular work. And I think one of the things I look towards is I look at Quebec and Montreal, uh, where the textile industry was undermined by public policy uh, through our, t our trade agreements um, that actually allowed for a lot of the work historically to go to Jamaica, and now it's been offshored to China and other places at the expense of uh, good workers a good system in place and good quality. And I think that's where we have to look towards is our trade agreements and following up with that. And if there are gonna be supports, then we support, say for example, child care, we support uh, dental care, pharma care, all the things that actually can subsidize the worker in a sense of making sure that any type of public money goes to the training and that individual's well being, so that governments uh, don't just fund corporations uh, and see that investment disappear to other areas. Uh, or we end up undermining our own selves by basically funding the competition. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government Health Center. So thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, this wouldn't be the, the first time in which I've actually rised on the issue of uh, forced labour um, and the impact uh, that has had on not only on Canadians but uh, throughout the world, uh, Madam Speaker. And you know, as an issue. Uh, we have had a number of debates on it. In fact, it wasn't that long ago that we were uh, debating uh, Bill S-211. Uh, I know, and I, I like to consider him as, as a dear friend, the member from Scarborough, uh, Gildwood, who has put in a, a great deal of effort on this issue and uh, corporate responsibility and good behaviour for, for many years, going well over a, a decade. Uh, in fact, uh, Madam Speaker, I can recall uh, when, we're in, uh, when I was in third party status uh, with the member from uh, Scarborough, Scarborough uh, Gilwood, uh, and, and he was talking about this and sitting beside individuals like Stefan Dion, uh, understanding and, and wanting to, to, to see us uh, deal with uh, an issue that no doubt is uh, of critical uh, importance. Um, one of the aspects that I have always thought was the way in which you get corporations uh, being able to uh, take certain actions as a corporation. 
and the individual board members were never really held accountable uh, for it. And when you take a look at S-211, uh, and there's many, many aspects of the legislation, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, but that was one of the aspects that I, that I had liked, where it put uh, more of a responsibility also on the directors, so you could go after, uh, after the directors, uh, where we do see uh, this uh, forced uh, child uh, labor uh, or forced labor in general. Uh, we had a, a very healthy debates uh, on, on this issue. I find it interesting today uh, the way in which the Conservative Party has actually brought forward the, what we are debating. And if I read the, the actual motion itself, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, it's pretty, it's not, it doesn't take long to read because it's pretty, pretty straightforward. The committee goes and they take a look at it, come back with a report, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, that the committee uh, report to the House that it calls on the government to immediately take any and all actions necessary to prohibit the importation of any goods made wholly or in part with forced labor and develop a strategy to prevent the importation into Canada of any goods mined, uh, produced or manufactured wholly or in part with forced labor. Uh, Madam Speaker, this uh, report was actually tabled here weeks ago. Um, and I found it interesting that the, the Conservatives actually chose uh, today uh, to bring forward uh, 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 the concurrence on the report, as opposed to just accepting it, because after all, I don't think there's anyone inside this chamber um, that doesn't understand the importance uh, of the issue, uh, whether it's the uh, Prime Minister or members of opposition, um, wanting to be able to see something done on this file, but I suspect that the motivation of trying to get the debate today has more to do with preventing uh, the NDP uh, from bringing forward a concurrence on a PROC uh, report, uh, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, so it's interesting that they chose this particular topic. I understand the way in which the, the rules uh, work inside the chamber. And uh, at, at the end of the day, um, I'm always happy to be able to talk about an issue that is so very, very uh, important. To the point of the motion itself, what I'd like to be able to do is to, to share with the, the members, and I don't need to table it because, Madam Speaker, it's, it's public knowledge. Um, you know, the member across the way that introduced the motion said, well, what is, what is the government uh, doing? The parliamentary uh, secretary spoke and spoke exceptionally well in terms of uh, how uh, Canada, in many different forums, can play a, a leading role uh, in uh, dealing with the issue of uh, forced uh, labour and the impact that it has on our supply chain. And the Conservatives were very quick to scoff at it, uh, Madam Speaker. And it's interesting um, to, to hear Conservatives when they're in opposition versus when they're, when they're in government. Because when I posed the question to the member in terms of, well, you know, it's all fine and dandy to be uh, you know, so critical uh, of the government uh, and making accusations that aren't necessarily founded, um, and I posed the question, well, what did, what did the former government do? the Harper regime, Stephen Harper, and the member mocked the question. Um, of course, Madam Speaker, because uh, Stephen Harper didn't do anything. Well, I would not have a problem in terms of contrasting that, in terms of what it is that uh, we have been able uh, to do uh, and, and deal with. Uh, the uh, parliamentary secretary made reference to that in terms of the, the international presence and what people uh, don't necessarily recognize uh, that we should acknowledge is that Canada, for a population base of 38 million people, carries an incredible amount of weight when it comes to international uh, policy. Uh, we have seen that in many different ways, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, I've always been a big fan, for example, of, of Lloyd Axworthy. And if you take a look at the, the banning of, uh, of landmines uh, as an issue in which uh, Lloyd Axworthy championed on behalf of the government of, of Canada and the success that we were able to achieve with it. And again, you've got to put it in the perspective of uh, the, the world. Well, the same principles apply for a wide variety 
of different uh, issues. And this is one of those issues. So unlike the, the scoffing uh, coming from the Conservative benches, I believe that the uh, Parliamentary Secretary that spoke before me, when he talked about that influence, standing up and speaking out, even in the presence, you know, and, and we hear a lot about uh, China because China was the example or has been the example that's, that's been used, whether it's the Uyghurs or the uh, Tibetans, uh, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that, yes, there has been a great deal of exploitation. But the government is not just talking about that inside the House of Commons, on the floor of the House. We are talking about that internationally, even in the presence of China. And yes, that means that the government of China, and often China officials, will be uh, uh, very uh, irritated. But, Mr. Speaker, it, I believe it is a role that Canadians expect because it is, in part, our values. You know, I think that if you take a look just at sheer immigration numbers and people that want to come to Canada, it is in a very impressive thing, Mr. Speaker. And it's because I believe they, they look at the values and the opportunities that Canada has to offer. And that translates into the House of Commons and the role that we play, not only domestically, but internationally. And that is the reason why, you know, it is important that whether you're uh, the Prime Minister or a critic from an opposition party, and you have the opportunity to be able to talk about Canadian values, then this is the type of uh, value that we should be uh, talking about. You know, we have a convention of, uh, of rights for, for children adopted by uh, the United Nations many years ago. And it talks about, you know, the rights for children and it, to protect them. And there are things that, that we can do. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, a few minutes back, I made reference uh, uh, to a public document. And the uh, parliamentary sector earlier made reference to it. I actually went and, and printed a, a copy of it, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it's the ministerial uh, mandate letter from the Minister of Labour. Um, this is something that's authored by uh, the Prime Minister providing instruction. Members that are... Uh, watching or following the debate can easily uh, look, in, look into it themselves by doing a simple Google search. And I'd like to, to make a very clear indication in terms of what it is that the, the letter states, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, coming from the Prime Minister, as the Minister of Labour, your immediate priorities are to work with the federally regulated workplaces to ensure that COVID-19 vaccinations are enforced for those workers uh, and to advance amendments to the Canada Labour Code to provide 10 paid uh, days of sick leave for all federally regulated uh, workers. I also expect you to work with federally regulated employers and labour groups and with provincial and territorial counterparts to make workplaces fairer and safer uh, for everyone across the country, as well as lead our efforts to eradicate forced labour from Canadian uh, supply chains. Uh, to realize uh, these objectives, I ask you to achieve results for Canadians by delivering on the following commitments. And it lists a number of commitments, uh, Mr. Speaker. And one of those uh, commitments, and I quote, with the support of the Minister of Public Safety, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement, and the Minister of International Trade, Exportation, Export, Promotion, Small Business and Economic Development, introduce, and I would like to emphasize this, Mr. Speaker, to introduce legislation to eradicate forced labour from Canadian supply chains and ensure that Canadian businesses operating abroad do not contribute to human rights abuses. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I would uh, challenge the, the member that has chosen to try to turn this into a political issue by saying, well, the government hasn't done anything and then goes on to, to criticize the Canada uh, border control. And that's why I posed the question, you know, in opposition, it sure is easy for the Conservative Party to be as critical as, as, as they want, knowing full well when they were in government, they did absolutely nothing 
on the file. You know, even during uh, a, a pandemic, uh, even uh, uh, during many other aspects, a, a war, you see that this is a priority of the government. And we have uh, different departments that are coming together to provide uh, legislation. Tell me where uh, the, the former government had any interest in getting uh, legislation. Now, they can talk uh, about, and uh, their math is all messed up, uh, Mr. Speaker, as it was pointed out uh, earlier, as one member says, well, eight years later. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, sometimes it takes a little while to clean up the conservative mess, and then we go into a pandemic. Uh, you know, there's a war that's taking place. But all, albeit, Mr. Speaker, we have seen other budgetary measures and legislative measures, some of which have already been pointed out uh, from a previous, uh, previous speaker. But we have a very clear indication that we are developing uh, the legislation. You know, it's, it's interesting. It was in the EU, and I, I thought I might have had it here, Mr. Speaker. Um, I guess it's uh, back in uh, September of 2022, the European Commission presented a proposal for a regulation to prohibit products made using uh, forced labor, including child labor, uh, on internal market uh, uh, of the European Union. Uh, the proposed legislation uh, fits into the context of the EU uh, efforts to promote uh, uh, decent work uh, worldwide. Um, now, I don't know all the details of it, uh, Mr. Speaker, but I think that it's important for us to recognize that it's not just uh, Canada alone. Canada does work very closely with its, with its partners, with its allied forces, the EU being uh, one of them. You notice uh, that was uh, uh, made reference to 2022. Madam Speaker, the, the Prime Minister's letter uh, to the Minister went back in uh, December of uh, 2021, uh, Mr. Speaker. And it does take time, because you have to factor in a, a great deal uh, of, uh, of considerations. You know, from a corporate, a good governance corporate perspective, they want to ensure that their supply chains are, in fact, uh, being uh, uh, supported by non-forced uh, labour. Um, companies that are prepared to put in that extra uh, effort will ultimately have more security going forward. Because I don't believe uh, Canada is alone, uh, Mr. Speaker. I believe that Canada is working with other uh, like-minded nations in recognizing the harm that forced labour uh, causes. And forced labour takes many different forms, uh, Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, there's exploitation of individuals that are here today in Canada. It's just, so when you think of, of exploitation of labour, don't just believe it's something beyond our borders. There is a role for provinces in particular, along with the federal government, to look at what's not only happening abroad, but also happening uh, here in Canada, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know it exists. And like I, I've advocated consistently in the past in regards to uh, the exploitation of, of human beings, it is just wrong. And as a parliamentarian, we'd like to make sure that we're making progress at dealing with that. Human smuggling takes place, and it is pure exploitation, whether it's uh, for getting an individual into a factory or selling an individual for sexual uh, services, uh, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, it is something that happens. You know, the United Nations, I believe, said something to the neighborhood of as could be as, as high as 10 percent. Don't quote me on it, Mr. Speaker, but I believe that it's somewhere in that neighbor worldwide where you see about 10 percent of the of the population of, uh, in, the, in the globe that are actually uh, exploited in one form or another. Now, I, I noticed that I, I mentioned the word uh, children more than anything else, and that's because that's where my primary focus is. But there are vulnerable groups, some more than others, uh, Mr. Speaker, that have to be taken into consideration. I like to, to believe that um, 
as Canada continues uh, uh, to move forward on this file, we will continue to have um, healthy discussions. I hope to be able to see, uh, as I know uh, my colleagues, uh, legislation that will be coming uh, forward at some point in time in the future once the appropriate consultation has actually uh, taken uh, place, uh, Mr. Speaker. I believe that this is an issue that has been there um, well before any of us were around. And I'm not just talking inside the House of Commons, Mr. Speaker, I'm talking in life in general. It is something that's not going to be uh, cured overnight. At the end of the day, we do have a responsibility, and that responsibility is, in fact, and has been taken very, very seriously. The government has saw, seen the, the benefits of, uh, of trade. Canada, more so than most countries around the world, uh, Mr. Speaker, is dependent on trade, exports and imports. It's not like we are a self-sufficient uh, producing a country where we do not require importation of products. Far from it. And that's one of the reasons why, as we move forward, and we will move forward on the file, that we do so in, in a way, Mr. Speaker, that Canadians can get behind and support. You know, interesting enough, we have reference to the uh, North America Trade Agreement. Where we, where we saw uh, incorporated into the trade agreement the issue of workers' rights and environmental uh, rights uh, concerns, uh, Mr. Speaker. As a, as a government, we have actually signed off on more trade agreements than any other government before us, uh, Mr. Speaker. Because we recognize just how important trade is to our country. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have very much taken a keen interest um, in regards to the supply chain and getting rid of um, the exploitation of people, Mr. Speaker. And I believe, in, in part, um, that we're going to see more effort on, on that issue in the coming uh, months uh, and years uh, ahead. So with those uh, few words, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank you for the opportunity to, to share some thoughts and look forward to any questions, if there are any. Questions and comments? Kissing Kamal uh, the Honourable Member for Dufferin Caledon. So I want to clarify, the, the, the government seat members seem to be saying, I said they've done nothing. I didn't say that. I said they've done things. They passed a, an advisory for businesses. They've had a couple of talky-talky moments at uh, uh, international uh, 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 places. Um, they've um, passed some, some legislation and other things, perhaps. But actually, the result is nothing, right? So it's a lot of talk for absolutely no results. And I think Canadians want results on this, Mr. Speaker. U.S. has seized 1,400 shipments, totaling $1.3 billion. Canada, zero. So all their talky-talky has actually produced no measurable, tangible results. And they could do it very quickly, Mr. Speaker. The U.S. has a list of companies, right? It's literally right here. I have it. They could give it to the various ministers, cut and paste it, deliver it to CBSA. It's simple. It could be done tomorrow, and it would stop at least these goods from coming into the country. Why is it so hard for this member and this government to do it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think that the, the member uh, belittles in terms of the efforts uh, that have been put into to place. And, uh, you know, the Canada Border Control uh, Agency uh, has done fine work uh, over the years in regards to uh, protecting the uh, interests of, of Canadians. Um, and unlike the, the former government, we have actually invested more in the CBSA uh, than, uh, than the former uh, government. Um, I can assure you um, that we have done more uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, uh, taking a product off the market than uh, Stephen Harper ever would have during his tenure uh, period of time. Question, I come on to the Honourable Member for Beauport-Limoilou. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague mentioned that there are international conventions to protect uh, children's rights, for example. Despite this, children are working every day sometimes for hardly any money in very dangerous conditions in other countries. Far too many are still beaten every single day or are fined on their salary for the tiniest of violations of rules, far from ideal conditions. This because a thirst for profit caused companies to delocalize and export their jobs under the recommendations of consulting firms. Yes, steps have been made in the right direction, but this won't be enough so long as children and families are still working in the conditions I've mentioned. To carry on carrying on is not enough. My colleague mentioned the importance of having to put forward more efforts. What tangible results in the future will the government put forward in order to protect the 99% of the population that is subjugated by the 1%? Thank you. Honourable Deputy Leader, Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I think, um, you know, I look forward, as I'm sure the member opposite does, in terms of the, the, the work that the Department of uh, Labour is, is currently doing, dealing with the issue at hand, working with uh, other uh, departments, doing the consultation that's actually, uh, it's, 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 it's essential. You have to do that uh, consultations, and, and it's a wide variety of consultations that have to, have to take place. Um, and that work is, in fact, uh, being done. I look forward to seeing some of the results of that work uh, in, the, in the coming months and years uh, ahead of us. Um, in terms of uh, the Convention of Rights for, for Children, um, I think that uh, comparably, you know, when you compare Canada to other nations of the world, we do exceptionally well. Uh, but we can play a very strong leadership role, and that's why it indicated Canada does often punch over its weight when it comes to be able to um, uh, ensure human rights uh, and protection of children and, and vulnerable uh, people by speaking out in the forums that we are provided to do so, and we'll continue to do that. Questions and comments? Question and comment, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of International Trade. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate uh, my colleague's comments and his contribution to today's debate. Uh, he talked about leadership on the, on the global stage, and we know that Canada remains the only country in the world to have created Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsible Enterprise. Another area of Canadian global leadership has been on the environment, and I want to put to him a question that has not yet been injected in a comprehensive manner into today's debate, but it is the idea that when we're enforcing standards on Canadian enterprises operating abroad, those include environmental standards. How can that help with our work to achieve net zero emissions by 2050? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I think that it, it, the member raises an excellent point, and that's one of the reasons why, when you take a look at the more recent uh, trade agreements, you will see that there is an environmental component uh, to it. You know, with the exception of the Conservative Party of Canada, Everyone else seems to understand and appreciate that climate change is, in fact, real, and we do have to do things in order to protect our environment uh, into the future. By incorporating uh, um, you know, environment uh, in our trade agreements, uh, I think it, it sends a very strong uh, message. It's also important, things such as the, the Paris Conference that had taken place back in 2015, when the countries around the world come together, uh, and we recognize things such as the price on pollution is a good thing, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. At one, that, at one time, even the Conservative Party uh, supported it, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there is many things that we can do just to, to enhance and promote uh, um, a healthier environment as well. Questions and comments? Question and comment, the Honourable Member for Santa's Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. It's a rare opportunity in this place to bring this sharp focus, one reason the Government of Canada has consistently failed, regardless of who is in the PMO, to meet climate targets. And it is directly related to the debate today, which is trade rules. The World Trade Organization interceded between when we used trade sanctions that made the Ozone Protocol, the Montreal Protocol of 1987, work spectacularly well in 1997 when we negotiated in Kyoto, and the difference was the interference by the World Trade Organization and trade ministers to say to environment ministers, you're not allowed to use enforcement mechanisms 
that work because we, the World Trade Organization trade ministers, don't like that. Now, it wasn't a ruling, but I, I, I put to this House that we need to re-examine the ways in which the World Trade Organization has undercut the work at the Paris Agreement, or for that matter, the more recent work at COP15 in Montreal. Trade rules must not undermine global survival any more than we use them continually to support forced labor and children's labor. We need to examine the trade rules and make them work for survival. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I believe that never before have we seen uh, the issue of our environment uh, elevated to the degree in which it uh, has been, uh, not only here in Canada, but, but in, uh, in many places uh, throughout the world. Yes, there are some chronic abusers, and, and there is uh, areas in which we could even improve uh, here in Canada, but we at least have a, a, a government that is committed uh, to doing uh, and making a difference, and that's one of the reasons why we brought in legislation to achieve, ultimately, a net zero, uh, Mr. Speaker. Because as a government, we recognize that something has to be done. As a government, we incorporated it into a trade uh, agreement. As a government, we have constantly uh, raising uh, the issue of, of environment when it comes to trade or virtually uh, all other issues, because we recognize the importance of, uh, of our environment. Yes, you want to come on to our questions and comments. Uh, one final quick one, the Honourable Member for Peace River Westlock. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I, I just wanted to question the member opposite, or just around uh, Canada's record when it comes to fighting a foreign uh, human trafficking and modern-day slavery. The United States, in the same amount of time, seized uh, 2,398 shipments uh, suspected tied to forced labor and modern-day slavery, uh, and Canada only one in that same amount of time. And then after. After that was contested, uh, they let it. They let it go through. Uh, do does the member think that Canada is doing a good job of stopping forced labor coming through our border? Thank you. In a whole 45 seconds, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think that you have to compare apples to apples, and the United States has a very different uh, situation in regards to human trafficking uh, than Canada. We both have uh, an issue in dealing uh, with it and, and responsibilities. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily know all the details that the member is making uh, reference to. I suspect that he might be uh, comparing apples to oranges. Reprise the debate, continuing debate, uh, Leonard of the Deputy to Calgary Shepherd. Thank you, Speaker. I do intend to split my time, but I just can't uh, quite notice the member I intend to split my time with. So when I, when I get there and when I, when I see the member, I will name his riding, it's possibly for the Welton, Re Wellington region. Um, I, I'm glad to be joining this debate because this is for me accountability to the government on the enforcement portion of passing legislation and regulations and rules and advisories uh, that come from the work that we do here. So it's holding the government to account. Part of holding the government to account is doing the work that the member for Dufferin Caledon did, which is he believed the government wasn't doing enough to prevent goods made with forced labor from coming into our country. So we ask ourselves questions. In this house, you have an option to ask an oral question during question period or you can turn and write a written question and then submit it to the government to respond to. And that's exactly what the member did. They're called order paper questions, written question. One is 1112, 1112, which basically asked the government a very simple question, how many goods since 2016 were seized at the border by the Canada Border Services Agency or the RCMP that were made with goods coming from the Zhejiang province using Uyghur forced labor? And the answer was a big fat zero, nothing. They had stopped one, and as the member before me from Priest River West, Westlock spoke and asked and commented on it, uh, it was then released. At the same time, the United States government seized over 2,300 goods, shipments, shipments of goods that were seized at the border because their government was directed by their Congress for specific areas that the Department of Homeland Security was told to watch for. It's on their website. You can go on to it. In fact, the member for Dufferin Caledon has repeatedly stated in the House he has that list. I looked it up. I have the list too. We'd be happy to provide the government the list and then they could use it. This is great. This is bipartisan cooperation. We're trying to help the government do its job. 
they could just come over to the site and we'll give them the list. There's even something called electronic mail. I don't know if you've heard of this speaker. We can send them the email list and they could actually use it and adopt it. The four areas that the Department of Homeland Security said were of special concern were apparel, cotton, tomatoes, and polysilicon. And based on that, four categories, four sectors they're especially concerned with, they've seized thousands of shipments of goods that were found to be using Zhejiang as the source country and Uyghur forced labor. Uyghur forced labor has gone up in its usage in the People's Republic of China since 2017. Those labor camps were established in 2017. There's a, there's a generalized acceptance that that's when this program started. The program is intentionally created by the communist government in Beijing. Uh, it started early on. The level of repression has been going up since Xi Jinping was first elected in 2013. He's on his third term and now likely his permanent terms as uh, essentially a, a dictator in the People's Republic of China. You know, when you compare the timelines, and the member for Dufferin Kalan did the work, the investigative work that a parliamentarian is supposed to do, and has proven that the government hasn't been enforcing the rules or it has been enforcing them, it's been incredibly lax. It basically hasn't done anything. And, you know, and since then, we, we've had one government caucus member after another, and parliamentary secretaries come out and give the best possible version of events. I mean, really try incredibly hard. And like some members have mentioned that some of them, you know, in the future, I hope never to be before court, but they, I, I will look to that side to find one of them to defend me if it ever comes to that because they really gave it the best possible face that you could have. They talked about convening things and declarations and meetings they had and advisories that were posted, an attestation, I've heard of the speaker, an attestation. You can click on a website, you read the terms of reference of what you're not supposed to do, and you click an attestation and move on. Actually, I was speaking to Member Duffin Calendar, based on attestation, the government's own officials say that nobody's been found guilty on broken them, there's been no follow-up on this attestation. Um, which reminds me of a Yiddish proverb speaker. It's a great one. I was looking for this one. It's, it's uh, from a book uh, called Kvetch. So it took me a while to go look it up so I could find it in there. A drowning man will grab even for the point of a sword. Drowning man will reach even for the point of a sword. In this case, it, it proves the point we're making on this side of the house that they've done nothing. If all you can point to is advisories and websites and web pages and ombudsmen that haven't done much of anything that we can say and attestations, well, we have a written question in the House with a response that says you have zero goods from this particular region, a region that is so egregious in its known violations of the human rights of the Uyghur peoples that the United Nations has written successive reports that we've had uh, rapporteurs go over there, actual rapporteurs actually doing the work on the ground of trying to ferret out what's been going on, uh, Bachelet in this case, uh, where we've actually had uh, repeat congressional hearings, we've had hearings here in different parliamentary committees of this house, in the United Kingdom as well, so we know what is going on. We have heard the stories of the Uyghur peoples. You know, I went even online to see the People's Republics of China's response to the United Nations report, and they said everything is A-OK, -okay. there's full employment in Zhejiang province. Like, everything is good, all laws are being respected. They especially draw attention uh, to anybody who would read it, it's on the back, I think it's page 109 of their response, saying that you know, the religious rights of the Uyghurs are being respected. There are so many mosques outside of the Zhejiang region that you could go to. And all of the rights, and you have nice pictures of very happy workers. I'm sure uh, all of them were you know, uh, knowing of what was going to happen here, that uh, they wanted to have it. And I noticed that the member for Wellington Halton Hills is, is getting ready to uh, speak after me and add to my contributions. I will share my time with him, uh, Speaker. And th that's the point. The, the, the government has reached for the sword, which is they're, they're pointing to what we are pointing to, which is they only have pretty words. They only have attestations and declarations and websites and web pages. Well, we have their own words showing the proof of their work, that they have done nothing since 2016. No goods have been stopped at the border and actually seized. What, like we said, one ship and was stopped and eventually it was released. Well, the Americans have proof that they have actually obtained results and we want results. And this reminds me of how our sanctions regime, equally there have been members that have come, um, members of the public who have come to testify before the Canada People's Republic of China Standing Committee, uh, Select Committee of the House, that have basically said that uh, the enforcement is lacking on the sanctions regime that we have. And this is, I, I you know, 
profess to you, Speaker, I believe this is part of the sanctions regime we have against regimes in the world who do things that we disagree with, that we find uh, profound violations of people's human rights. This House has found that uh, the People's Republic of China is committing genocide against the Turkic Uyghurs in Zhejiang province. The House has said that. In fact, the government was so inspired by its own principles, it abstained on that motion. It sent in a minister at the time, who's now resigned from this House, uh, to say that uh, you know, they're, they're abstaining as a, as a government, as a cabinet, they're choosing to abstain on the matter. And it, deeply embarrassing for them. And it should be embarrassing for them. It's embarrassing for all of us that they would do that. We've, had, we've passed a motion since then calling on the government to uh, expedite and ensure that another 10,000 uh, Turkic, Turkic Uyghurs would be brought to Canada as refugees, that we would identify who they are. This is, incredibly, this is an incredibly important part of ensuring that we have accountability in the House. When they are not doing their jobs, they need to be raked over the coals for it. If the Minister of National Trade has the time to hand out uh, you know, a sweetheart $25,000 contract to a friend, she has the time to expect that her cabinet and the rest of her colleagues, and she is doing the job that she is sent here to do. She's named to the cabinet. She should be doing her job. We have proof now that she is not. She's failing on the job to deliver the results that are needed. And she hasn't done. 2016, Speaker, it's been seven years. It's been seven. And I just heard a member say, it's the pandemic. We blame the pandemic. When world trade was collapsing and less goods were being shipped, it's not as if the CBSA stopped doing its work. They were still on the job. Because it's not as if goods were stopping, being stopped all over the world at the borders. We still have many goods coming into the country. I see Speaker you're giving me the signal. I almost wish I hadn't shared my time with the member for Welding Halton Hills. I could have used an extra 10 minutes to lambast the government for its failure. But we owe it to the people in Zhejiang province to ensure we have a regime in place that stops goods, seizes those goods at the border made with their labor. The Americans have done it. Other Western governments have done it. We have the results now showing that by the government's all accounting, they haven't done it. Shame. Thank you, Speaker. Here, here. Questions and comments? Kestia Tomaltara, the Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, uh, Madam Speaker, or Mr. Speaker, the, um, uh, the Conservatives uh, make a, a great deal of reference to China. And on all issues, they tend to focus a lot of attention on China. And my question to, to the member is, um, what would the member suggest the Conservative Party in general would do in dealing with ch uh, China when it comes to the issue of trade, uh, given there was a secret trade agreement that was signed off with, uh, with uh, the former uh, Prime Minister of Canada? And I'm wondering if he could provide his thoughts in regards to, does he feel that there should be what kind of a consequence generally for China based on the comments that we're hearing today from the Conservatives? Honourable Member for Calgary Shepherd. Well, uh, Speaker, that, that's actually quite simple to answer. I would turn to the member for Dufferin Caledon. I would uh, ask him for the electronic list of all the companies that uh, the Department of Homeland Security has that's list of basically sourcing forced labor goods and trying to ship them in, and I would give them to the CBSA. It's pretty simple, and the particular treaty he's actually referring to is not secret. It's a public document that was approved by the House. Question a commentaire, questions and comments. The Honourable, the Honourable Member for Timmins James Bay. Mr. Speaker, I've been reading uh, Watson's Dictionary of Weasel Words. It's a fascinating book, and I've been studying it very closely. There's such good words like aspirational, drill down to recontextualize. But I'd ask Honourable Colleague, on the term move on, I'd like to just quote it so I get it correct. It means going forward basis. It's a popular form of escape from responsibility, accountability, or discomfort, much favored by cads, con men, and carpetbaggers, etc. As in, let's not dwell on the past, let's not wallow in the lens of history, let's not waste public money setting up inquiries, let's not t argue wasting time arguing about who said what and whether or not they meant it. I'd like to ask my honorable colleague if he thinks that the uh, advice that we're getting from the Dictionary of Weasel Words might help. Uh, give clarity to the debate that we've been having in the House for the last few weeks. The Honourable Member for Calgary Shepherd. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm not sure which book it is that he's referred to. I kind of missed that part. I did catch the word inquiry, though, and uh, I still notice we're waiting to hear how the New Democrats intend to vote on our, on our motion to call the Chief of Staff and the Prime Minister to testify before a committee of the House. 
STL, a come all tech questions and comments. Uh, the honorable member for Dufferin Caledon. I want to ask the member, so uh, there is an advisory that's been put out by the Government of Canada which says the Government of Canada is deeply concerned by reports and documentary evidence of the repression of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities uh, by Chinese authorities. Um, the U.S. Uh, version says the People's Republic of, of uh, China government continues to carry out genocide and crimes against humanity against Uyghurs and members of other ethnic and religious minority groups in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region of China. The PRC crimes against humanity include imprisonment, torture, rape, forced sterilization, and persecution. What if a member could comment on why is the government of Canada's approach to this, including not seizing any goods, seemingly so at odds with our number one ally and trading partner? Of the deputy to Calgary Shepherd. Thank you, Speaker. So the member is absolutely correct. You know, he named off kind of some of the the crimes that that uh, we see happening against the, the Turkic Uyghur peoples in the Zhejiang province. Uh, that really ramped up since 2017, the start of these formal. Uh, labor camps that the regime in Beijing keeps referring to as vocational schools, typically. Uh, that's kind of the nomenclature that they use. Uh, you know, as someone of Polish heritage, um, I, I, I'm pretty used to this from communist regimes. They give everything weird names. Uh, Potemkin uh, villages come to mind as well. Um, this is consistently done by regimes like this. And we should be aligned in this case with our partners in the USMCA who have done a much better job, especially the Americans have done a much better job in enforcing the rules. If this is truly, we're going to take this to heart, we have to enforce the regimes and the sanctions regimes passed by this House. Questions and comments, the Honourable Member for Beauport and Limoilou. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to hear what my colleague thinks about the answer we got earlier about the fact that there are consultations about the actions that should be taken to improve the situation with regard to forced labor uh, to eradicate it. In other words, but when it comes to child labor, the Convention on the Rights of the Child was signed in November 19, well, over 34 years ago, and so there's been consultation for 34 years, and we're not actually, perhaps, that means that all of the inhabitants of the planet's, planet are being consulted when, in fact, action should take place. Thank you. The member for Calgary Shepherd. Shepherd. Of course, I agree with the member. There's a Yiddish proverb that says uh, that a drowning man shouldn't take a sword to try to save himself. But when it comes to you know, kind of consultations, websites, attestations, all of that is not enough. What we need is enforcement on the border to ensure that the products that come into this country are not produced through forced labor. Resuming debate. Uh, the Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. The government can introduce all the legislation it wants. Parliament can adopt all the legislation the government presents. The government can introduce all the regulation it wants. It can sign all the treaties it wants. But if it doesn't operationalize that legislation, if it doesn't operationalize those regulations, if it doesn't put into effect those treaties, it's all for naught. And what is going on with Xinjiang is a good example of this. Clearly, a genocide is taking place in Xinjiang. As you know, Canada is obligated under the Genocide Convention to prevent genocide. Article 1 of that convention says, quote, the contracting parties confirm that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law which they undertake to prevent and to punish. One of the elements of a genocide is, quote, imposing measures to, intended to prevent births within the group, end quote. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights said that the birth rate in Xinjiang plummeted by 50 percent, by one half, between 2017 and 2019, in two short years, in 24 months, from 16 births per 1,000 people to eight births per 1,000 people. So clearly, one element of the genocide is taking place. Two other elements of genocide under the Convention are causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, and secondly, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life 
calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. And there is evidence, Mr. Speaker, that both of these two elements are also in place in Xinjiang, in the massive detention camps the PRC has set up in Xinjiang. Evidence based on satellite imagery, survivor testimony, investigative journalism, leaked documents, smuggled videos, and so many other pieces of evidence documenting hundreds of detention camps that were built by the PRC in Xinjiang province. It is estimated that more than 2 million Uyghur Muslims have been detained in these camps. Some experts have called these camps the greatest detention of a group of people since the Second World War. PRC authorities first denied the very existence of these camps, but when presented with high-resolution satellite evidence, they recanted and ex explained them away as simply educational camps. Documents obtained by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists have highlighted what is going on in these camps, including torture and forced labour. There is evidence that Uyghurs are being forced to pick cotton and produce tomatoes, that the PRC is exporting around the world, just like what happened during another genocide, the Holodomor in Ukraine in 1932 and 1933 where millions of Ukrainian peasants were forced to produce grain that Stalin then exported to the rest of the world and left them with nothing, not even seed grain for the next year's planting and harvest. And as a result, over three million Ukrainians starved to death. So clearly, a genocide is taking place in Xinjiang, and Parliament recognized that a genocide was taking place in early 2021 by adopting a resolution in this House. It is now time, Mr. Speaker, for the government to uphold the international-based, rules-based order. It's now up to the government to uphold two treaties to which this country is a party. First, the 1948 Genocide Convention. By preventing genocide from continuing, by preventing the importation of products like tomatoes and cotton that have been produced using forced Uyghur labour. Another treaty that the government should be upholding, if it's serious about upholding the rules-based international order, is to uphold our obligation under the Canada-United States-Mexico trade agreement. Article 23.6 of the agreement requires Canada to ban imports produced with forced or slave labour. The agreement says, quote, Accordingly, each party shall prohibit the importation of goods into its territory from other sources produced in whole or in part by forced or compulsory labour, including forced or compulsory child labour. Subsequent to the signing of the USMCA several years ago, Canada and the United States adopted legislation to implement the Cosma Treaty, to implement the elements of that treaty that ban imports that have been produced using forced or slave labour. Parliament amended the Customs Tariff Act in July of 2020 to come into conformity, to make, bring Canada's laws into conformity with COSMA. And the government published regulations stemming from those changes to the Customs Tariff that came into effect that same month, in July 2020, some two and a half, almost three years ago. A year later, the United States also changed its laws to bring its laws into conformity with the COSMA Treaty. But here's where the similarities end. While the similarity between Canada and the United States is that both of us have implemented laws bringing COSMA to effect, both of us are party to the Genocide Convention, the, the similarity ends right there. Since these laws have come into force, the United States has stopped thousands of cargo container shipments from entering the United States from Xinjiang. But Canada has stopped not a single shipment, not one shipment from entering this country. In fact, the government temporarily halted a shipment, one shipment, from coming into Canada and subsequently released that shipment 
I believe that was, Mr. Speaker, in the province of Quebec. But no shipment has been blocked and interdicted and prevented from entering Canada, despite the fact that south of the border, the U.S. government is upholding the rules-based international order and has prevented the importation of thousands of cargo containers containing things such as tomatoes, cotton, solar panels that have been produced using a labour force of millions of Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang province. Despite the U.S. interdicting thousands of shipments, the U.S. government has admitted this isn't good enough. In fact, they have plans to hire over 300 new positions at the border to continue to interdict even more products coming into their country from Xinjiang. They have plans to implement new computer systems, new training. They're conducting outreach to importers to prevent further shipments from arriving on American shores. But in Canada, nothing. Nothing has happened, despite the fact that the law came into effect almost three years ago. One shipment, Mr. Speaker, temporarily blocked and then admitted into Canada. Meanwhile, thousands of cargo container shipments have been blocked from Xinjiang by the U.S. government because they are upholding their treaty obligations. They are upholding their laws. They are, uh, are upholding the regulations that they have published. They are upholding the rules-based international order which this government says it supports. But yet, as CBC and The Globe and Mail and so many other investigative journalists have reported, tomatoes and cotton produced from Xinjiang, likely with forced labour, have continued to flood Canadian supermarket shelves, Canadian uh, retail shops, and the government turns a blind eye, despite the fact that it has these treaty obligations under COSMA, that it has these treaty obligations these laws in place, despite the fact that there's regulations that have been gazetted. So let me conclude by saying this, Mr. Speaker. The government can introduce all the regulations it wants. Parliament can pass all the laws it wants. The government can sign all the treaties it wants. But none of this is of any effect unless the government of Canada and its agencies operationalizes these laws, operationalizes these regulations, upholds these treaties, and starts putting the work in place to actually block shipments from Xinjiang from coming into Canada. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, I support the motion in front of the House. If the government is truly going to uphold our international reputation, truly uphold the rules-based international order that it says it so deeply believes in, that starts with doing exactly what we are calling for in this motion. Stop blocking cargo container shipments at the Port of Vancouver and at other Canadian ports that contain con tomatoes and cotton from Xinjiang that have been produced using forced and slave labour. Questions and comments? Uh, question 8, Kamal Tower, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, one of the things I made reference to uh, during my comments was in regards to uh, the Minister of Labour and the mandate letter that's been provided by the Prime Minister, which gives very clear indication uh, that we are uh, to be developing uh, uh, legislation, and uh, that legislation is, in fact, uh, in the works. Now, um, I'm not going to indicate in terms of when we'll see it because I'm sure the member can appreciate that it does inquire or require a great deal of uh, consultation in working with a, a wide uh, spectrum of different types of uh, stakeholders. And I'm wondering if the, if the member could provide uh, his thoughts in regards to the type of uh, work that should be done uh, prior to introducing uh, legislation, uh, given the, the, the consequences of a substantive piece uh, of legislation uh, that uh, we would no doubt be hope to be uh, producing sometime, whether it's in months or, or years from now. The Honourable Member for Wellington, Halton Hills. Well, Mr. Speaker, the government doesn't need new legislation. It's got immense powers under existing framework legislation. It has immense powers under the Customs Tariff Act and its regulations. The government needs to get its hands dirty and figure out what exactly it needs to do to empower the Canada Border Service Agency's officers 
to interdict these shipments. It needs to sit down with frontline officers and say, what do you need? What do you need in terms of training? What do you need in terms of computer systems? What do you need in terms of personnel? And let's get this done in the next six months so we can stop bringing in these products that have been produced using this Uyghur forced labor. Question and commentary, questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Repentigny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to thank my colleague for his speech. And I have to say that his answer to the Parliamentary Secretary, well, I, I agree with it. Absolutely, we didn't need to talk to each other about it. There are billions of dollars in play, and that is why the situation is, is not going to change suddenly. Uh, between 2015 and 2020, there was an increase of the estimate amount of, of goods uh, produced with forced labor, or the amount, the, the value of them. So when it comes to ideas about how to improve the situation, does he think that maybe transparency and labeling could be solutions? The Honourable Member for Wellington Halton Hills. I would like to thank my colleague for her question. And I think we need an awful lot of information from this government. It is a problem here in Ottawa. Ottawa is a place where there is no information compared to other capitals in the G7. Lack of transparency and information. It's very difficult to find out from the government whether or not shipments have been interdicted and blocked. Uh, we often have to get that information through access to information requests or through other investigative techniques rather than the government being transparent about what's going on by default. And so I think that adds to the problem here is that People are generally not aware that we are not upholding our treaty obligations. We are not upholding the rules-based international order when it comes to preventing imports using uh, forced or Uyghur labour. And, and I think part of that problem is the lack of transparency from this government about what exactly is getting interdicted at the border. We do know one thing. No shipment has been blocked from Xinjiang that has been produced using forced Uyghur labour. Comments? Question come on, The only member for Windsor West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks for my colleague for his intervention. With regards to the CBSA officers, one of the things that we had this summer was mandatory uh, working during vacation time and mandatory overtime. Um, one of the things that we could do is actually expand um, their operations and boots on the ground, so to speak. I uh, wonder what his comments are about that versus that of, I guess, right now as an agenda to actually move to more automation. Uh, where do the Conservatives stand on that uh, position? The Honourable Member for Wellington Halton Hills. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's hard for me to give a specific answer to that question uh, because we're not presently in government. I don't have access to that information, unfortunately. But I think the Minister should sit down with frontline CBSA officers and obviously the, the head of uh, the, the uh, head of the CBSA to talk about what resources and tools they actually need to start blocking these cargo container shipments. Ninety. 8% or so of the world's trade arrives on these cargo containers. There's got to be a way uh, to introduce, to implement computer systems, training, uh, and other measures in order to interdict these shipments. The United States has been doing it. They're further improving on their record. There's no reason why Canada can't do the same. And just as the warning, there's a three minute uh, to go here. The Honourable Member for, uh, for Reprise du Debat, continuing to debate the Honourable Member for Peace River Westlock. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's my honour to rise today to talk a little bit about the forced labour that's happening around the world and uh, the concerns around. Uh, the importation into Canada of some of these uh, products that have been produced with forced labour. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit today about uh, products that uh, that get a f get a free pass, so to speak. So uh, we have uh, increasingly we have these uh, environmental governance uh, and social indicators um, that ESG is what it's called about, and and to some degree that ends up having uh, a watering down effect of folks that have. Uh, environment, uh, uh, so-called environmental footprint, um, uh, get get a get a, f a free pass on some of the other issues. And so, uh, there's been a number of organizations around the world that have pursued looking at so-called green technology, uh, wind turbines, for example, solar panels, for example. Um, and what happens is these products get a great brand uh, around their their 
their environmental bona fides. Bona fides. Uh, so you see, you have, uh, you've got people with solar panels or the wind turbines, they, they get a relatively free pass. We can override a number of other issues. Uh, we've seen right here in the province of Ontario, uh, a, lot of, a lot of frustrations by uh, locals who live in, in, in areas where they're putting up uh, wind turbines or solar fields, uh, the locals not necessarily appreciating that and yet having little recourse in order to fight that. Now we see the same thing happens when it comes to forced labour around the world. Uh, when it comes to the production of wind turbines or solar panels, for example, uh, a blind eye is turned to the forced labour that happens for those things. For example, in Congo, uh, the, most of the cobalt in the world, if not all the cobalt in the world, comes out of Congo. Uh, vast amounts of that cobalt is harvested by uh, forced labour and child labour. Uh, we've had examples uh, from uh, the U.S. Department of Labor where the polysilicon that goes into uh, the making of the uh, solar panels, uh, so up to 75% of that polysilicon is coming from forced labor uh, around the world. Uh, we've got uh, a 90 uh, reports have identified 90 Chinese and international companies whose supply chains for these solar panels come from uh, forced laborers. Uh, we, we see these uh, seven of the top ten uh, wind turbines, uh, wind turbine manufacturers are, are come out of uh, out of China, and over 50 percent of them uh, have been installed. Over 50 percent of the installations around the world come from these uh, seven uh, seven companies coming out of China. Most of these companies have been identified by a uh, by the Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, they they have shown that forced labor. Uh, is a major part of all of these companies' supply chains. And so there we, I just wanted to highlight today that uh, while these are green technologies to some, sometimes that allows us to overlap or overlook uh, the forced labor that is in many of these products. So thank you for the time today, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, look forward to continuing. It is my duty to interrupt proceedings and now place the question before the House. By Mr. Jenis moves that the fourth report of the Standing Committee on International Trade presented on Thursday, February 9, 2023, be concurred in. If a member of a recognized party, president in the House, wishes that the motion be carried or carried on division or wishes to request a report of division, I would invite them to rise and indicate it to the chair. The honourable member for Dufferin Caledon. I would request a recorded division, Mr. Speaker. So pursuant to order made on Thursday, June 23, 2022, the division stands deferred until later this day at the expiry of time provided for oral questions. The House will now resume with the remaining business under routine proceedings. And of course, we're under the rubric of motions. Any other motions? The motion? No. So we go to presentation de petition, presenting of petitions. The Honourable Member for York Simcoe. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I rise today to present a petition th signed by thousands of Canadians, including the residents of the town of Georgina and the small but mighty community of Pefferlaw. The petition calls on the government to prohibit the development of the so-called Baldwin East Aerodrome. To date, the Liberals have done nothing to prevent the planned dumping of more than 1.2 million cubic metres of potentially contaminated soil on the environmentally sensitive area within the Lake Simcoe watershed, and have ignored the previous involvement of the aerodrome proponents in waste management and illegal fill dumping. The petitioners are calling on the Minister of Transport to prohibit the construction of the Baldwin East Aerodrome and amend related Transport Canada regulations to infer, ensure that false pretense of building an aerodrome cannot be used to illegally dump fill. We need action, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Presenting a petition, Special Tasset Petitio, the Honourable Member for Calgary Shepherd. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm so glad to have caught your eye for this petition. It comes from constituents of mine who are calling on the government to prioritize Hazaras coming to Canada as part of the 40,000 target of Afghani refugees to draw attention of the House to the fact that over 28,000 Afghans have been brought to Canada as refugees. They also remind the House that for the past 130 years, the Hazara ethnic group has faced genocide and systemic ethnic cleansing in Afghanistan, that since the fall of Kabul in August of 2021, Hazaras have once again been targeted by the Taliban regime, as they are also a minority 
religious community. The Taliban regime is responsible for the massacre and genocide of Hazaras. Uh, Taliban gunmen have directly been involved in executing Hazaras and forcing them to leave their homeland. And again, they remind the government of Canada, as part of its international obligations, it has an obligation to also ensure that the Hazaras form a sizable proportion of the 40,000 Afghans who are being brought to Canada uh, as refugees. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Presenting a petition, President Tasset Petition, the Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Many thanks, Mr. Speaker. And as I rose to present the petition today, I'm struck by how timely it is. We wouldn't have known when I pulled this petition for today what we would be debating in concurrence debate. But the petitioners from my writing are calling on Canada to pay attention to the fact that companies within Canada Canadian-based companies are responsible for human rights abuses around the world, uh, killing, attacking, harassing Indigenous peoples, other citizen societies around the world, marginalized groups, uh, on their way to also damaging the environment in those countries. These petitioners call on the House of Commons to require, through new legislation, to protect human rights and environmental due diligence that Canadian companies prevent adverse human rights impacts and environmental damage throughout their activities and supply chains, and requiring these companies to do due diligence as to subcontractors and so on to be sure that the products Canadians buy from them do not involve human rights abuses, forced labour or slavery, and to avoid, insofar as is possible, environmental damage around the world, and to establish a legal right for people who have been harmed by Canadian companies overseas to seek justice in Canadian courts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Presentation petition, presenting our petitions. Uh, there you go. Uh, since there's none, we'll move on to the next rub rubric. Uh, or questions on the order paper, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I would ask that all questions be allowed to stand at this time, please. Now it's orders of the day. Orders of the day, Audrey du jour, Government Orders, Government Bills Commons, resuming consideration at second reading of Bill C-23, Historic Places of Canada Act. We left C-23 last time. I believe the Honourable Member, Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader had about a minute in his speech, so that means he's got 19 minutes left in his speech. So the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and what a pleasure it is to be able to, to rise and talk about uh, what I suspect should be legislation that all members of this House uh, should get on side and support. If you think in terms about uh, uh, C23 and what it does, it's all about uh, people, places, our history, uh, our heritage. And when you think of our heritage, a flood of things that come to mind, at least uh, for me, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, that Canadian identity, that wasn't that long ago we were talking about the 198 billion 10 uh, year uh, uh, health agreement between the national government and all the different provinces and I can remember standing saying that you know our health care system is at the very core of what it means to be a Canadian. So you can talk about a policy of that nature or you can talk about Canada's rich diversity which I would argue is second to no other country in the world, uh, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I often have had the opportunity to, to talk about that diversity. When I go to a multitude of different types of events, whether it's in Winnipeg North or outside of Winnipeg North, we often hear about Canada's greatest, one of our greatest assets is in fact our diversity. Our heritage is changing every day through people and the things that we do as a society, I would ultimately uh, argue, uh, Mr. Speaker. Compare those values that we have today to what it would have been 30 years ago in terms of diversity and the, t and the way in which we approached a wide variety of different uh, areas. And today, I think that uh, when you take a look at the C23, one can't help but to reflect on a private member's bill that was uh, actually passed through the House a couple of years back. Uh, it had the second reading, it went through the third reading, um, it ultimately went to the Senate, but it died, unfortunately, uh, in the Senate. It was a, a, a private member's bill, 374, which was actually introduced by uh, my friend and colleague, the member from uh, Cloverdale Langley. 
a man that is very passionate about our heritage and our parks and brought forward this uh, legislation. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, that that legislation actually received unanimous support uh, in the House of Commons prior to going to, to the Senate. Now, it's not word for word, uh, the legislation. In fact, it's, there's quite a significance in, in difference between what we have before us today and ultimately what passed through the House in that unanimous uh, way, uh, uh, but died in the Senate. But, Mr. Speaker, I think the, the principle of the importance of our historic uh, places, uh, people, and acts uh, is something in which we have to make sure that we preserve. And that is what uh, C-23 is actually all about. That is why I believe at the end of the day, I would hope that all members will support it. You know, it was interesting if I could find it here. It's something that I did not know. Um, and that was in regards to the channels. And it um, makes reference, uh, Mr. Speaker, to uh, a number of channels in, in Canada. Now, you'd think I'd be able to find it, but it appears that I might not be able to, uh, Mr. Speaker. Oh, yes, no. I'll put on my glasses, if I may. And, and why it's important is that there are nine historic canals that are listed in the bill itself. Rideau Canal, uh, Trent, uh, Severn Waterway, Salt St. Uh, Marie Canal, and this is the one that really kind of made me reflect. It's in the province of Quebec, uh, St. Hours Canal. Now, my ancestry, a few generations back, came from that area. And I suspect that some of my family might have even historically been a part of that. But it goes on to, to list the canals. So whether it's in Ontario, Quebec, or the one in Nova Scotia, and the important role that it plays, and it gives specific directions. I use the canals because if you take a look at what it is that the legislation does, is it establishes a very strong framework in dealing with something that should be important to all of us, Mr. Speaker. The designation of place, person, and or events in Canada is something that we should all take an active uh, interest in, uh, Mr. Speaker. And that's what I like about uh, the legislation. And I believe it also then, by passing this legislation, will put us at par and maybe even better than some other uh, jurisdictions, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. So it's something that, uh, as the member from Cloverdale and Langley had pointed out uh, uh, to members a couple of years back, it's something, I believe, that is, that is warranted that is necessary. And I'm glad that the department has made it a, a priority to the degree in which we're actually having that uh, debate, uh, not only today, but the, the other day uh, when it was uh, first uh, introduced. And I would hope, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, members would see fit to uh, supporting uh, the legislation ultimately so that it can uh, go to a committee. Um, and hopefully receive some sort of passage. And let's get it back uh, into, uh, into the Senate, hopefully before the end of the year, uh, Mr. Speaker, because, um, as I say, it's not identical uh, to uh, Bill C-374, but it sure did receive a great deal of support. When I think of the, the legislation, there are certain parts of it that I think that I, that's worthy for me to, to make reference to. The Truth and Reconciliation uh, Report or Commission um, is something that uh, I and I know many members of, this, uh, of the House of Commons hold very dear. We want to see action on the calls for action, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, over the last number of years, we have seen many calls acted on by this government. Whether it's statutory holidays, the uh, language uh, legislation, there have been many different um, calls for action that have been acted on. And within this legislation, you are seeing the call to action number 79. 
And, you know, it's, it's gratifying because at the end of the day, it's hard to believe that we have to put into uh, legislation at this late, you know, this is something that I would have thought would have been automatic many, many, many years ago, decades ago, perhaps, uh, Mr. Speaker. Legislation that ultimately puts into place a guarantee of indigenous representation, for example, on the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada. This is a board, Mr. Speaker, that helps portray uh, Canada's uh, history and where we have come from. And at the end of the day, how can one not uh, incorporate uh, uh, call to action number 79? So I'm glad to say that it has been incorporated into the election, uh, into, election into the um, legislation. I'm glad to see that it expands by talking about when, when a board is actually looking at some form of designation, that it also needs to take in consideration Indigenous knowledge so that we ensure that there is a, a fair reflection of our, of our history. I want to give a, a tangible example, Mr. Speaker, that I think has really made a, a profoundly positive difference in the city of Winnipeg. In the city of Winnipeg, we have what we call the Forks. And that's where the, uh, the Red River and the Assiniboia River uh, come together. And there are some historic buildings that are there, uh, Mr. Speaker. You can talk about uh, um, the Via Rail Station, by the way, where you can get your citizenship uh, court ceremonies often in, a, in such a wonderful heritage uh, building. You can talk about um, what used to be fr uh, freight, uh, uh, not containers, but uh, freight type of buildings, uh, Mr. Speaker. At one time, the Forks was really a, a rail yard. There was very limited access uh, to the Red and the Assiniboia. And what you had is the different levels of government recognizing the, the, the heritage that was within the Forks and invest millions of dollars in terms of converting uh, the Forks into what it is uh, today. They took heritage buildings and converted them into a modern use uh, while preserving uh, their heritage, uh, Mr. Speaker. And you will take a look at the walkways along the, both the Red River and the Assiniboia River and the value that it has added to the city of Winnipeg. Today, it is the most visited spot in the province of Manitoba. Um, a number I heard a while back was close to two million visits a year at the Forks. And uh, there is a very important educational component uh, to it for children and adults alike, uh, Mr. Speaker, as it continues uh, to evolve. Prior to this investment and recognition, you might have virtually nothing in terms of people going down to the Forks compared to what it is uh, today. And ultimately, Mr. Speaker, there is no comparison. There is no comparison because uh, at one point in time, it was something that was hidden away from the residents of Winnipeg and those that were visiting uh, our city. Whereas today it is recognized, as I say, as one of our shining attractions. So if you're going to be going to Winnipeg, you have to go and check out uh, the Forks, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's an area in which Winnipegers are very, very proud of. You can talk about downtown uh, Winnipeg, or you can go into rural communities. The Riding National Park, if you were to check with some of my conservative colleagues from the rural northern area, you'll find that they are very proud of the Riding National Park and the many things that it has to, to offer. 
in the museums that are located in many different uh, communities. What's important, I believe, and again within the legislation, there's mechanisms that enable anyone to ultimately uh, make the suggestion and bring forward what they believe should in fact uh, be recognized, uh, Mr. Speaker. So it's not just top down, it is something that anyone in our communities can say, well look, this individual, example for me would be a, a Louis Riel from, from Manitoba. You know, this place, you know, I would suggest you the forks, as I've highlighted as an example, or event. One could talk about the occurrence that took place in Upper Fort Gary many years ago, or what was taking place in Lower uh, Fort Gary, all of which is an example in Manitoba. Things that could be recommended in hopes that maybe they will be accepted. When I talked about the fact that this legislation puts into place a very strong framework, through it and uh, complemented by regulations, you will see that there is a criteria because no doubt we all have personal opinions, Mr. Speaker, in terms of what we think should be recognized from a national historical perspective. We all have our personal thoughts on that, but we need to establish a criteria. So first and foremost, I would say that, look, within the legislation, anyone can come up with their thought, that person, that place, or that event, and recommend and suggest that it be recognized. The, um, the, the criteria and eligibility would likely restrict uh, a number of those thoughts and ideas, at least possibly for the, for the short term, uh, Mr. Speaker. But at the end of the day, we have an excellent organization in the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada. So that when you think in terms of issues such as um, transparency and sustainability and the issue of reconciliation, we have a, a board that's in place that's there to protect uh, the interest of Canadians in preserving those important things that we hold as part of our Canadian identity. And as I had mentioned, within the legislation, now it's mandated that we will get uh, full participation from Indigenous community uh, members, along with uh, provinces which have been there in the past, and a, and a, and a few others, uh, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Speaker. At the end of the day, this is the group of individuals uh, that will ultimately provide those recommendations and, and assist in drawing the conclusions. One of the things, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I didn't make reference to, and I see you're already telling me I don't have very much time left, so I'm hoping um, to expand on some of those heritage buildings. We have beautiful heritage buildings across our country. Um, I made reference to a couple of them in my example of the forks, promoting the forks today, Mr. Speaker, as you can tell. Uh, but there are... Um, uh, federal buildings throughout the country that have played some historical significance. I think of, I think it's Pier 21 in Halifax, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember having a tour of that uh, facility, and you get that sense of pride, uh, that that is a part of our Canadian identity. Immigration today is so critically important to our country, as it has been in our past, uh, Mr. Speaker. And that Pier 21 amplifies that. Take a look at what they've done with the building. Obviously, if you had a picture hundreds of years old, uh, it would look quite different than what it looks like today. But because of uh, intergovernmental investments, because of literally so many volunteers that recognize the true intrinsic value uh, of Pier 21, if you were to take a, a walk through it today, 
what you would see is a modernized facility that preserves and protects the heritage of the building itself. And that is something, Mr. Speaker, that we should be encouraging. Not only does it protect our, our history and preserve it for future generations, it also creates jobs through alternative uh, usages. It brings people into the facility so they can learn more about our heritage, uh, Mr. Speaker. It becomes an attraction. And if you talk to uh, the minister responsible for tourism, it doesn't matter where you take him in Canada, he's talking about how wonderful our tourism opportunities are. I think that we underestimate just how important uh, our heritage can be in terms of promoting and using as a magnet uh, for, uh, for tourism. So if people take a look at the legislation, it is not controversial. It is legislation that should be universally supported by all members, as the member from Cloverdale and Langley brought through Bill C-374 a couple of years back, Mr. Speaker, and received unanimous consent. So I hope uh, that my colleagues in the Conservative Party will recognize that and not want to filibuster this particular bill, Mr. Speaker, and hopefully we'll be able to see it get uh, even possibly royal assent before the end of the year. How nice that would be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're really impressed that he was talking about that. The Honourable Member was talking about the canals in Nova Scotia, the sh historic Shubenacadie Canal uh, was the one that was on the list. Uh, questions and comments? Question come on to the Honourable Member for dufferin Caledon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, I guess th uh, the first thing I would say is um, I, I struggle to understand why this bill had first reading in June of last year. It's only being brought back now uh, for second reading almost a year later. Um, if this is something that the government feels is so important, it seems like they lack urgency on this as long as uh, miss other things like the motion the concurrence debate we just had uh, there's no urgency there um, going through law school I was always told that the devil's in the details and I have some details that I want the member to comment on so under this piece of legislation the minister is going to have the ability to restrict or prohibit navigation anchoring or mooring of vessels in historic canals so the minister is going to have that ability. For example, the Trent Severn in Ontario is a massive tourist draw. People use that all the time. The minister could shut that down with the powers under this bill. The other troubling part of the bill is that the, uh, these powers can extend to lands adjoining or incidental to historic places, which could be lands that are privately owned. So what safeguards is this member willing to put in place so there can be no overreach by the minister with respect to using historic canals or uh, lands adjoining historic places? The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would first of all suggest that uh, there's the issue of ministerial accountability in which uh, uh, if there was an issue of closing down a canal, I suspect that there would be a great deal of thought before a minister would actually close a canal. It goes far beyond just the, the department having to make a decision upon itself, a great deal of consultation. And uh, you have opposition members that would be more than happy to hold the minister accountable if, in fact, uh, a, a poor decision was being made, not to say that our government would make a poor decision. The member opposite also made reference to why we waited so long. Because, you know, bringing forward legislation to deal with child care, dealing with dental benefits, dealing with a wide spectrum of issues to support uh, Canadians, even though the Conservatives didn't support most of that stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, it all takes time to get through. If only we had more time in which we could actually bring things back. I can assure the member... Uh, that the, it is a priority for the government. We do want to see the legislation uh, passed, and hopefully the Conservative Party will be sympathetic uh, uh, to allowing this bill to, to pass, given I suspect it has unanimous support of the House. The Honourable Member for Pontigny. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In a speech in December on C23, the Bleu Québécois confirmed its interest and its desire to be for Bill C-23, first of all, because it's part of Canada's will to respect its international commitments when it comes to UNDRIP, for example, and so it recognises Indigenous knowledge that could help the Commission to make decisions.
My question is, will C23 be serious enough, severe enough, so that contractors and builders can't simply once again destroy historic sites in order to build whatever they want and to do business and to make business on the backs of the on the back of the environment and on the back of Canada's history. Honorable Secretary Parlementaire. Uh, the short answer to that is yes. And I think that uh, through time what we have uh, witnessed um, is that uh, people continue to understand and appreciate uh, the importance of our heritage and our, and our buildings. To this very day, Mr. Speaker, I, I find it somewhat shameful, for example, that the city of Winnipeg lost its original uh, city hall. Uh, it, was a, it was an absolutely beautiful building. I don't know, and I wasn't obviously a part of the decision-making process back in the 60s, uh, Mr. Speaker, but I, I, you know, it was such a, a beautiful, historic building, and I don't think for a moment that we would have lost that uh, in, in, in today's uh, values or attitudes uh, towards the importance of preserving our heritage. I believe that this legislation uh, has the teeth, obviously it will be supported by uh, regulations, and I think that the, the type of support for the legislation goes far beyond just the House of Commons, uh, but also incorporates uh, Indigenous uh, community support uh, and provincial uh, support. Question come on there. Questions and comments. Uh, the Honourable Member for New Westminster, Burnaby. Um, merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Et <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Because this government, quite frankly, um, legislation calls for ensuring that there is Indigenous representation. But we know that this government has uh, failed in so many ways in terms of providing uh, respect to Indigenous peoples. We see this with the boiled water advisories. We see the, the lack of uh, by Indigenous for Indigenous housing. These are all crucial elements where the government, quite frankly, has failed over the last few years. Uh, so I wanted to know from my colleague uh, how the government will step up to ensure that their investments that are adequate uh, to actually ensure Indigenous representation and participation uh, on, on these boards and in these activities that are foreseen by the bill. Parliamentary Secretary to the Government House Leader. Yes, uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I would have to agree to disagree with the member opposite. I believe that the government has made uh, significant strides. In fact, I would suggest to you that no government in the history of Canada has made more uh, efforts and uh, provided more financial resources and has taken more action than this government over the last six years in terms of addressing the importance of the relationship between uh, Canada and Indigenous uh, people, uh, Mr. Speaker. At the end of the day, uh, within this legislation specifically, there's a call for action number 79, which ensures that there's a, a, gar a guaranteed uh, uh, partnership uh, within the uh, Historic Sites and Monuments uh, Board uh, of Canada, Mr. Speaker. It also ensures uh, that when the, the board is making decisions, that uh, Indigenous uh, considerations have to uh, be taken uh, also uh, into consideration in making uh, decisions. Joey Kamaltar, uh, the Honourable Member for Sandwich Gulf Islands. Thank you. Permit me for a moment, because I'm sure you felt the same sense of nostalgia for Pier 21. I just want to call out the name of the woman who made it possible, a dear friend of mine, the late Ruth Goldblum, who did that. And I also wanted to my Honourable Friend from Winnipeg North, shout out to Gail Asper, who did the similar driving force work to give us the Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg. With that, I definitely support Bill C-23, but it needs work. It's strange to the heritage community. People can't figure out how could this piece of legislation fail to use the same terminology, national historic site, something people are used to. This throws a great deal of uncertainty into how we protect our national sites. How many Crown Corporation sites are not covered? How many federal buildings that are designated important to our heritage are left in a, in a sort of murky state. So I'll be bringing forward amendments, flagging that, and I ask the Honourable Member, first uh, chance I've had to speak to C23, will the government be open to amendments to improve this legislation and ensure it meets the needs and demands of the heritage community? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I think I would be disappointed if the member, uh, the Green Party leader, did not bring amendments. Um, she consistently does that, and the short answer to her question would be is that the Government of Canada has demonstrated over the years that we are very much open to uh, amendments if, in fact, it adds strength and makes the legislation uh, better, uh, Mr. Speaker. Whether it's coming from uh, 
um, Liberals, Conservatives, NDP or Green uh, members. Um, the idea behind this is to make it uh, uh, better, strong uh, legislation. As I say, it's establishing that uh, healthy uh, framework. And as the member also pointed out, the individual. There are so many individuals that are in our communities. They don't necessarily hold elected office, but they contribute immensely to ensuring that uh, the proper recognition and designation is given uh, to so many things, the, the peoples, the events, um, and the places, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and I would like to express my appreciation uh, for, for the fine work that they do in preserving and through, through that preserving, encouraging that future generations of Canadians are going to be able to have the type of uh, value that we see within uh, the heritage sites that we have today. Reprise de debat, continuing debate. Uh, the Honourable Member for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, rise to speak today. I'll be sharing my time with the hardworking member from Dufferin Caledon. Um, Mr. Speaker, um, this is a piece of legislation that has some good things in it that I think everybody in this House um, will, uh, will support. It also has some things that... Uh, um, speak to the importance of the committee system and uh, getting a bill to committee so that experts can weigh in and, uh, and uh, highlight any potential shortcomings, any potential um, unintended consequences that might result from uh, um, legislation that, that tries to do maybe as much as this uh, bill tries to do, which is not incredibly clear. And I think um, even the government recognizes that because they uh, brought this bill forward in June of last year, and uh, this is the first time that we're actually debating it in the House. So, you know, on the front of things that we can all agree on, I think, in this House, uh, you know, the, the, the move to amend the Historical Sites and Monuments Act to include First Nations, Inuit, and Métis representation on the Historic Sites and Monuments Board, I think, is really important. Uh, that representation is a, is a, a significant step and uh, an important part of the legislation. Um, other things that we might agree on, uh, you know, I think that it is uh, really, really important to um, preserve our heritage. It's really important to Canadians to have the ability to uh, visit, visit places of, of historical significance, uh, learn uh, from the stories that are told at those places, and, uh, and, and, you know, I would encourage all members of Parliament to um, to uh, visit as many of these places while we have the opportunity to meet Canadians as we can. Um, I'll, I'm going to use the opportunity to speak to one place, one such place that it, I would highly encourage members uh, of Parliament, particularly members from the government side and the NDP and even the Bloc to come and visit, is listed on the Canadian Register of Historic Places. Um, this is a place that's right in the heart of my constituency. In fact, it's about three minutes from where I grew up uh, in the town of Devon, and it is uh, the Leduc No. 1 Discovery Well site. And uh, just reading from the actual Canadian Register of Historic Places for everyone's benefit, because uh, I'm sure once uh, folks hear this, they'll learn, learn some things and, and it will drive them to want to come and visit uh, and, and learn some more. The heritage value of the Leduc No. 1 Discovery Well site lies in its association with the finding of massive petroleum deposits in Alberta and its connection to the dramatic social and economic transformation of the province in the second half of the 20th century. I'll just break away from what the document with the registry says to point out that it also led to a dramatic social and economic transformation in this entire country, and we all and our kids and grandkids, for those of us that have kids and grandkids, have benefited from this, and future generations will also benefit from what happened in 1947 at the Leduc No. 1 Discovery Well site. So continuing um, from the Canadian Register of Historic Places, it goes on to say, in the first half of the 20th century, Canada was almost entirely dependent upon the United States for its oil supply. As Canada's industries were established and grew, the demand for domestic oil to power the country's economic engine grew. The Imperial Oil Company Limited, founded in Ontario in 1880, began to explore for oil and gas deposits in Western Canada in the 1910s, and for three decades they were unsuccessful, drilling 133 dry wells in the region. On February 13, 1947, however, 
the Leduc No. 1 discovery well blew in to the delight of the spectators assembled for the occasion. The eruption of oil from Leduc No. 1 triggered extensive exploration for f further petroleum deposits as seismic teams, geologists and geophysicists fan physicists fanned out across Alberta in search of black gold. Though the Leduc field was a major find, new fields with even larger petroleum reserves were, would be discovered in subsequent years. Again, I'll break away from this, Mr. Speaker, to speak to the relevance of this bill. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that for some members of this House, this is a new story, a story that they hadn't heard before. But it is a story absolutely critical to our history as a country, certainly to the history of my province and my region, but to our economic history, our economic story in Canada. Um, and if more members of Parliament maybe understood this story, took the time to visit parts of the country where maybe there would be a little bit of a different view on political issues, the issues that we discuss in here every day, we would have better debates with more context than maybe we have right now. So I'll continue again. Um, this is from the Canadian Registry of Historic Places um, um, that this bill uh, addresses and, and, uh, and, and seeks to fine tune in terms of uh, our approach to our, our Canadian history. It says, the spectacular discovery of oil at Leduc in 1947 marked a watershed in Alberta's economic and social life. The find attracted massive American capital investment into the province and resulted in the creation of wells, refineries, and pipelines throughout the province. Oil exploration also uncovered another valuable resource under Alberta's surface, natural gas. The population boomed in subsequent decades as fortune seekers, many of them well-educated professionals flocked to Alberta to tap into the province's newfound wealth. New towns were established near oil fields in both, and, and both Edmonton and Calgary grew dramatically. Edmonton became a service centre for the oil fields and home to numerous refineries, while Calgary developed into the administrative and managerial heartland of Alberta's burgeoning petrochemical industry. The tremendous wealth generated by the province's reserves of oil and gas also accelerated the demographic shift in Alberta from a rural to an urban population and funded the creation of universities and colleges, galleries and museums, and hospitals. And that's where the entry in the registry ends, Mr. Speaker. But I point out to that last, uh, that last phrase there, funded the creation of universities and colleges, galleries and museums and hospitals, Mr. Speaker, because that funding just didn't accrue to the benefit of Albertans, Mr. Speaker. That, that funding accrued benefit for Canadians across the country because through transfer programs and tax revenues and all of the different economic mechanisms uh, that this country has established uh, over the years, some of which uh, um, are wide, widely supported and some of which are widely debated, uh, among my constituents, there's no question that our health care system that we enjoy today across this country, that our education system, our post-secondary education system, our social safety nets across this country from coast to coast in every province and every territory owe to great extent the benefit um, that has come from uh, the, this, this uh, one plot of land in the centre of Leduc County um, that is recognised on the, the Canadian Register of Historic Places. And Mr. Speaker, uh, as I close, I would, I would encourage every member of this House, as we debate really, really important issues around environment and health and um, immigration and, and all of the different things that we, uh, day after day, debate with an eye to making Canada better and better and better. I would encourage members of Parliament who have the opportunity to fly into Edmonton. Sounds like uh, in, the, in the coming weeks we'll finally get direct flights again. You can fly into Edmonton, a 15-minute drive from the airport. You can come out and visit this site of historic importance in uh, Leduc County at Leduc No. 1. Um, you can come out like the member from Louis Saint Laurent, my, uh, my uh, colleague, uh, conservative colleague, has done. Uh, had an opportunity to host him at Leduc No. 1 at one point in time. Gave him a little bit of a tour of the Canadian Energy uh, Museum there. And uh, it was interesting. He came out and a bus pulled up, a tour bus pulled up. And I was kind of excited as a member of Parliament to introduce my distinguished colleague from Quebec to the folks on the tour bus. 
And lo and behold, wouldn't you believe the, the folks on the tour bus got off the, off the tour bus and every one of their face, faces lit up as they saw this celebrity. This was a tour bus, tourists from Quebec visiting Alberta. And uh, the member from Louis Saint Laurent was an absolute celebrity as he shook hands with every single uh, uh, person on that bus. And I grew to understand uh, why this, this gentleman is such a legend uh, in, in his home province of Quebec and in his riding. So I've got 30 seconds left, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm just, I've used my time to give one example of the potential benefit of this legislation if we get it right. I'm really looking forward to taking a look at some of the challenges with the legislation or potential challenges with the legislation at committee and hearing what uh, experts from across the country have to say on some important parts of this, uh, of this bill. Thank you. Questions and comments? Question and commentaire. Deputy de Bob. The Honourable Member for Bobar Limoilou. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I agree that the bill should go to committee so that it can be amended in the ways deemed necessary. My colleague said at the end of his speech that there are challenges raised by the nature of the bill. And when I look at it, there's clause two in the definitions. I do not see a definition of what a person of a national or a place of national interest is exactly at clause 24 sub 1 where there's a time period for the minister to support a request of the commission regarding the designation of such a place that's a challenge as well does my colleague agree or are there other challenges that he sees the honorable member for Edmonton Benasquin I thank the honorable member for the question uh, there are numerable challenges uh, with this bill, many challenges potentially with this bill, and uh, um, among the least of them might be definitions. Um, I think that speaks to why the government has taken so long to actually bring it forward for debate. Uh, I have other concerns. I, you know, we're a country right now over the last eight years that has had a significant challenge uh, building anything. I want to make sure that as we protect our Canadian heritage, that we don't inadvertently in efforts to do that make it harder and harder to actually uh, build anything in this country. I think that's an important part of the conversation that we can uh, take a look at when we get this, uh, get this bill to committee, and we hope to hear more of that through the debate in the House today. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for New Westminster. Mr. Speaker, I always appreciate the, my colleagues' uh, interventions in the House. I, I understand that he uh, is really putting forward a change position from uh, the Conservative Party five years ago uh, when the Environmental Committee, uh, the Committee on the Environment, had a study on heritage sites and Conservatives said, though they agreed in principle with the need to support Indigenous perspectives in heritage sites, they felt that this would represent additional stresses to the federal government's fiscal framework. And I get the sense that the member is really providing a new position at the Conservative Party, that they do believe uh, that it is important for Indigenous peoples to be represented and that there be adequate resources to ensure their participation in, in these important sites. Uh, could the member clarify, is the Conservatives, have the Conservatives changed position from five years ago? The Honourable Member for Edmonton, Wetaskiwin. Well, absolutely uh, not, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this is a different piece of legislation. The member uh, has been around this place for a long time and understands that, uh, um, you know, different legislation requires a different approach. Um, there are important conversations that we need to have. I represent an area with a, a significant uh, Indigenous population, many of it living off reserve. Uh, there, we have the community of Masquachis just south of my constituency, which already is the largest constituency uh, in the country by population by a long way. And uh, I take my role as a member of parliament to hear from constituents and constantly learn from constituents every day, really very, very importantly. And uh, this is again why it's so important to get this bill to committee and make sure that we hear from experts from across, across the country in every community uh, in, in terms of uh, ensuring that we have always the strongest legislation we can. 
Reprise de debat, continuing debate. Uh, and we'll actually have exactly 10 minutes to, to, to do that. The Honourable Member for Dufferin Caledon. Thank here. you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And really happy to be able to um, discuss this bill today. Uh, I obviously think there are some very good things within this bill. Um, I think that uh, it sets up the historic sites and monuments board of Canada. Uh, it's going to add Indigenous representation, which responds to uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Recommendation Number 79. Uh, I would quickly note that uh, this piece of legislation had first reading in uh, June of 2022, and you know here we are in March of 2023, and it's coming up for second reading. And I'd, I wonder why it's taken the government so long to do this. I, I was a history major in university. I love history. I love the concept of expanding uh, Canadian historic sites from coast to coast to coast. Uh, I love the idea of finding ways to make sure we maintain them, uh, maintaining birthplaces of, uh, of prime ministers. So there are certainly things within this bill that I like, and I'm very happy to support. However, um, going through law school, we are always told uh, the devil is in the details. And when I look at this bill, um, to me, uh, I'm describing it as the iceberg bill. And I question why uh, they've designed the bill in such a way. If they really wanted unanimous consent to a bill like this, why did they put so many things in this particular piece of legislation that can, quite frankly, be considered to be controversial? And I want to talk about those. And I'm going to explain that the, the, the actual pieces of the legislation I find could be controversial, but when I combine it with how I have so little faith in this government uh, to do what's right, that's what gives me incredible pause. You know, for example, um, they say they've done lots to prevent uh, the importation of goods made with forced labour from the Xinjiang region of uh, China. We had a concurrence debate on that today, and the evidence is they didn't do anything. That's one of the reasons why I don't have a lot of faith in how they're going to implement certain uh, sections of this bill. So I want to talk about this. Um, the first thing is that uh, it gives the minister the following powers, like to recognize the national historic significance or national interest of places. So that's fine. They can make that designation. That, I think, is absolutely fine. But when that has taken place, um, the minister gets other powers. And that's what I'm concerned about. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So with respect to historic places and historic canals... This bill is going to give the minister the power to restrict and prohibit the navigation anchoring of mooring of vessels in historic canals. Now, if they designate a different waterway, Mr. Speaker, a historic place or historic waterway, will those powers extend there? For example, if you were to dedicate a certain portion of waters on the west coast of Canada as a new historic site or a historic waterway, would the minister then have the powers to determine whether or not navigation can go through that? If you think of uh, the, uh, the 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 um, uh, the ship, it, sorry, the, the the tourism industry on the west coast. Uh, that has to do with that on cruise ships, etc. Would the minister therefore have the ability to limit where the cruise ships can operate? That is sort of deeply problematic to me. And right here in Ontario, we have the Trent Severin system. There are thousands of Canadians that have cottages along the Trent Severin. And the minister would have the power to restrict uh, or prohibit vessels mooring or operating in the Trent Severin waterway. Now, they'll say, oh, the minister would never do that unless the minister absolutely had to. But the power to make that designation or the reasons for being able to make that designation are not defined in the bill. It's a blank check. Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry to say this, but I would never give this government a blank check for anything because they just have such a terrible track record on things like this. So... This is highly, highly problematic, and it has to be studied at committee, and I'm very hopeful that the government members, recognizing how important it is to add Indigenous representation to the Historic Sites and Monuments Board of Canada, that they will put some guardrails in place to restrain the minister's powers to make these kinds of restrictions or prohibitions, because that's the way to build consensus with all parties and to make sure this bill will pass speedy. Well, this bill will have speedy passage. 
They don't have a good track record of doing that, though, Mr. Speaker. The general approach is it's our way or the highway. And so I'm asking them today to make very sure that there's going to be a very collaborative approach to how we do this. The member, um, uh, the member for Edmonton, Leduc, talked about Leduc, I think he said Leduc well number one, and the historic significance of that, which could be designated by the minister. So the minister has the power to designate an historic place. That is fine. I think there's somewhere near 36,000 submissions on this. So these designations uh, will take place from coast to coast to coast. Again, Mr. Speaker, the devil is in the details of that because what the bill also gives powers to is this, that they may, the minister may have the authority over lands adjoining or incidental to historic places. So what does that mean? And why hasn't that been clearly defined in the Act? So let's say, for example, uh, they decide to declare an historic place near your property. But then they say, the windmill on the property, it's kind of taking away from the historic place. You need to take the windmill down. Or we need this chunk of your land. What are the rules regarding that? What's, our, what's going to restrain the minister's power? Now, you might be saying, well, you're sort of reaching or overreaching except this government doesn't have a good track record of collaborating. This government doesn't have a good track record of ensuring that they don't overreach. And I could go on and on about the challenges of the minister having power over lands adjoining or incidental to historic places. Have they defined what incidental means? I think we can all understand what adjoining means, but have they defined what incidental to means? Of course they haven't. So why have they done it? And why have they included language like this in a bill that they say everyone should support? It's, it's sloppy drafting. Um, it's trying to put way too much into this that shouldn't be there. There are other powers in this bill that, of course, weren't mentioned uh, in the member's speech and haven't been discussed. So. There are new offences created under this Act, and if a person is convicted under this Act, the court can order the seizure of, uh, of a, an item or property. So let's think back to my example of the Trent Severin. They say you can't operate in the Trent Severin. Someone who has a cottage there decides, well, I need to get in my boat to go to the grocery store because those exist. They can be charged. The boat can be seized. That's a problem. But wait, there's more. They're also setting up the Historic Places Protection Fund. Where is the funding for that going to come? It's also not clear in the bill whether the fines, the, 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 the proceeds of seizures, will those funds go into the Historic Places Protection Fund? Because you can think of the conflict of interest that exists if the government says, well, the more things we seize, the more money we have in the fund. And we know this government likes to tax everything, whether it's the escalator tax on alcohol, whether they're going to triple, triple, triple the carbon tax. This government is addicted to tax and addicted to revenue. So if there's an incentive in this bill for them to seize property or personal property, and use those proceeds, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to say we have to be very concerned that that is exactly what they're going to do. So this bill, I agree, we should support it, it should go to committee. But this committee needs to do the really hard work of looking at what exactly is in this bill. And I'm hopeful that I've illustrated just some of the concerns that I've had with this legislation. The committee will take those concerns very seriously, find ways to rein in this, uh, the power of the minister that is unconstrained now, define what incidental to means, and make it clear that the proceeds of seizing things is not going to go into this fund. Those are my concerns. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And when we return, we'll do, uh, we'll do questions and comments. But right now, statements by members. Uh, Declaration de député, l'honorable député de Halifax West. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. To take part in many events uh, this month held in recognition of International Women's Day, including an inspiring luncheon hosted by Nisa Homes, a nonprofit operating 10 women's shelters across Canada, the Vedenta Ashram Society celebration of Halifax's Hindu temple, 
to pay tribute to the women volunteers who have supported the temple for five decades, the Power of Success Dinner for All Women in Business, and had the honor to join the 67th session of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, where issues like the gender pay gap were on the agenda. I also announced over $1 million in federal support for entrepreneurship centers in Halifax West. Mr. Speaker, much work remains, but I'm confident that we're building a, a brighter world for women. As my daughter welcomed beautiful baby Isabel Angelina, my first granddaughter last week, my hope is that all doors will be open for the next generation of girls. Merci beaucoup. Before I go to the next honourable member, I just want to remind everybody in the chamber that SO31s are being uh, spoken and everybody wants to hear, so let's keep our talking to a minimum so that we can all enjoy what's being said. The honourable member for Niagara West. Earlier this month, I attended the ceremony for the Font Hill Kinsman Citizen of the Year Award. This is a very special event in my riding of Niagara West. We are all happy to gather safely in person to celebrate once again after a three-year break due to the pandemic. I've attended almost every year since I was elected back in 2004. This year's recipients were Brad and Braden Sapaway, a father and son duo who helped raise almost $10,000 for Pelham Cares, a local charity. How did they do it? Well, for the past three years, Braden and his dad have decorated their truck in Christmas lights, 9,000 lights to be exact, to raise awareness for funds for charities. Next year, they're planning on adding 10,000 lights to the truck. What an incredible story of solidarity and generosity. Other folks that have received the Kinsman Citizen of the Year are Gary and Rosemary Chambers, Ron Corr, and Michael Jox, among many other outstanding members of our community. I'm proud to represent Pelham and other townships in our close-knit community of Niagara West. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Mississauga Streetsville. Mr. Speaker, today marks World Down Syndrome Day. The 21st day of the third month was selected to signify the uniqueness of the triplication of the 21st chromosome which causes Down syndrome. Down syndrome is naturally occurring chromosomal arrangement that has always existed and is universal across all racial, gender and socioeconomic lines. One in every 781 babies born in Canada has Down syndrome. I want to take a moment to recognize the incredible individuals with Down syndrome who make important contributions to our communities every day. Unfortunately, these individuals often face discrimination and are denied opportunities to fully participate in society. This year's theme is with us, not for us. So as we celebrate this day, let us commit to creating a more inclusive society that values diversity and supports those with Down syndrome and their families. We, together, we can create a world where everyone can live fulfilling lives. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for ABTB, Temiskaming. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At the prestigious culinary competition Bocuse d'Or in Lyon, the Signé Cameline Oil received the first prize in the innovation category which is an extremely important global distinction and the first time for a Quebec product, I would like to proudly congratulate the Olimega family business, which uses sustainable methods for its crops and that I saw start up 15 years ago. Chantal Van Winden, Raymond Durivage, Guillaume Cloutier, and Marc-Antoine Cloutier, I'm so pleased to congratulate you and your team. Signé Camélin is a 100% Quebec product, which is nutrition, very nutritional and which is processed in saint Edouard de napierville And Camelina is a beautiful yellow plant, which is also raised, uh, cultivated in Temiskaming, in my area. And I'd like to congratulate as well Agritem, Alain Sarrazin Farm, Mondou Farm, Farm, and I'd like to congratulate Lorraine Mondou and Michel Robert, who are here today. Thank you. The Honorable Member for Vaudreuil-Soulanges. Mr. Speaker, this week I am celebrating 11 weeks of remission for my cancer. And I have the honor of being the honorary president of the Relay for Life of the Canadian Cancer Society, which will be occurring in Pankou on June 10th. Tonight, Mr. Speaker, I will be walking for Tarek, a young, bright man who went on to West High, went for Westwood High School and completed his first year at John Abbott College. He was passionate about history and politics. He loved to draw, paint, 
play video games, and build Lego. Above all, Mr. Speaker, he loved spending time with his best friends, Bella, Aisha, Haley, Maddie, Jazzy, Isabel, and Flanny. Sadly, Mr. Speaker, Tarek lost his battle with cancer on January 26th, taking his last breath in his mother's arms at the age of 19. Mr. Speaker, Tarek was a warrior. During his treatments, his mother said he never complained. He just carried on. If he had a message to share with anyone else battling cancer, it was, be brave. You got this. To Tarek's mother, Donna, his sister, Serene, and his great aunt, Sharon, who join us in Ottawa today, I want to thank you for sharing his story with me. He truly was a special young man. It will be an honor to walk in honor of his memory in June, and I would invite everyone in my riding to join me to pay tribute to those who are still fighting, to those we have lost, and to help put an end to cancer. Thank you. The Honourable Member for North Okanagan, Chuswap. Elections in Canada are for Canadians to decide, not to be influenced or decided by foreign interference to suit foreign interests or agendas. If our elections have been inter it interfered with by foreign entities, Canadians deserve to know who is responsible, what actions have been taken against them, and what is being done to prevent it from happening again. And yet the Prime Minister and his Liberal NDP government are blocking attempts to get to the bottom of how Beijing operated interference networks to affect our 2019 and 2021 elections. Canadians want and deserve a public inquiry into this election interference, and they deserve to know why the Prime Minister and his NDP friends are doing everything they can to prevent this from happening. What does the Prime Minister know? When did he learn about it? And what did he do or fail to do about Beijing's election interference? These are questions from Canadians and people of the North Okanagan Shuswap. What does the Prime Minister have to hide? For Vancouver, Grenville. Across Canada, many communities celebrate Nowruz, the time of the, the beginning of the Persian New Year, the coming of spring. It's a time for sharing a meal, assembling the Haftsin table, and most importantly, it's a time for family and friends to come together. However, around the world, from Iran to Tajikistan, Turkey to Afghanistan, many communities that should be celebrating have been facing extreme difficulties. They are in our hearts, thoughts and prayers, and we wish them peace and happiness. This year, our families celebrated our son's first Noruz, a moment of great joy for us and a chance to pass on traditions from one generation to the next. May this new year bring us all peace, prosperity, love, and light. Noruz Mubarak, Nevroz Mubarak. Sure. Honorable Deputy de Vimy. The Honorable Member for Vimy. Mr. Speaker, as a proud Canadian of Hellenic origin, I rise in this house to commemorate Greece's Independence Day and the struggle of the Greek people to free itself from the Ottoman Empire. March 25, 1821 symbolizes the courage of the Greek people, which facing a powerful foreign force fought for its independence. Honor all the heroes who sacrificed their lives for the reestablishment of Greece Greek civilization, democracy, and the Orthodox faith. We also recognize the cultural and political impact of the Greek Revolution and its influence on the modern world. The Greeks have inspired us with their courage, resilience, and love of freedom and democracy. Then, and as reliable allies against tyranny, more recently. Zito i kosti pemti martiu hila octakosa i kosiena, zito i elas, Zito Canadas, Evkaristo Kiria Proedre. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. President. Just want to remind the honorable members that uh, statements are being made and they're very important to the individuals and very important to us. I just want everyone, if they're talking, to talk much lower or wait until the statements are over, then come back in the chamber so that we can all enjoy and hear what the honorable members have to say. The honorable member for Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Hey. Mr. Speaker, one of the biggest issues small businesses and industries are facing across Canada is labor shortages. However, even businesses that find qualified workers, there's no affordable 
place for them to live. It's not just workers that can't find a place to live. I have not-for-profit affordable housing projects for seniors that have been impacted by the Liberals' record inflation that has more than doubled construction costs from $3 million to $7 million. Inflation isn't the only problem. I'm hearing from affordable, sustainable housing projects that are running into a wall of bureaucratic red tape with respect to rezoning and permitting that delay construction while costing hundreds of thousands of dollars. During a public housing meeting that I hosted, the frustration from Canadians, developers, municipalities and not-for-profits was palatable over the lack of affordable housing. Addressing the housing crisis ultimately comes down to a simple question of supply and demand along with urgent action. I recommend the Liberals start adopting the policies we put forth on housing accreditation and getting rid of the gate creepers, or get out of the road and let a cons Conservative government do it. Yeah. 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 Honourable member for Sydney, Victoria. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate the 2023 winners of the New Waterford Coal Bowl Classic and the School Sport Nova Scotia Division II Boys Basketball Provincial Champions, the Breton Education Centre Bears. <laughs> Known for their relentless full court pass defense, that defense led them to multiple point victories in each of their wins. This year's Coal Bowl felt for many like a return to form as the first tournament held since the pandemic began to the impact our communities in 2020. The first ever Coal Bowl was held in 1982, but this is the first year that both contenders for the top spot came from Cape Breton. The Bears played fellow Cape Bretoner, the Riverview Avens, in the championship game to take the title. But it's no surprise that two of our top spots were from Cape Breton because Cape Breton creates champions. Congratulations, Beck Bears, on your well-earned victory. Go Bears, and I'm glad you could be here in Ottawa to celebrate that today. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Yorkton, Melville. Continuing inflation, skyrocketing food prices, rising interest rates, unaffordable housing, labour shortages, foreign interference, daily reports of violent crime, ethics violations. No wonder the anxiety level of Canadians has continued to escalate as every day brings new revelations of overreach and failures by this Liberal NDP coalition. As April 1st approaches, Canadians brace for the tripling of the Liberal carbon tax, and the cost of everything will rise again under their mismanagement. What this government is underestimating is the resolve of the people of Canada. Canadians refuse to yield. The day is coming, coming soon, when they will exercise their power. The Canadian men, women, young, old will exercise their right to bring about change. Then, together, with a majority Conservative government, we will fix what they've broken. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Yellowhead. Mr. Speaker, repeatedly this Liberal government proves they do not care about Canadians. If they did, then inflation would not be at a record-breaking 40-year high. Their solution? An automatic escalator on the alcohol excise tax. Increasing taxes on beer, wine and spirits by 6.3% on April 1st, alongside the carbon tax like a sick April Fool's joke. This tax increase will devastate consumers, beer, wine and spirit producers, 95% of which are small businesses, and other Canadian entrepreneurs who can barely make ends meet as it is. This tax hike will also have sweeping negative impacts on industries like tourism, food and hospitality, among and many others. Enough is enough already. Taxpayers should not have to pay for this Liberal government's chronic fiscal mismanagement. They should not have to struggle under this cost of living crisis. Will this Liberal government axe their planned excise tax, yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. Once again, I want to remind everyone that SO31s are taking place and we all want to hear what the honourable members have to say, so I want to encourage them not to speak very loudly or just whisper amongst themselves rather than talking loudly and interfering with the honourable members and their messages from back home. The honourable member for Orleans. Mr. Speaker, March symbolizes our francophone pride and linguistic duality. On March 20th, yesterday, Francophones in my community of Orleans and throughout Canada and the world celebrated Inter International Francophonie Day. In my community, at 
Merbleau Catholic School with my colleague, the Minister for Official Languages. I met with students and spoke with them about the importance of speaking, speaking French, studying in French, and living in French. March 8th was also International Women's Day. I was lucky enough to welcome more than 115 women in my community for my ninth annual dinner. It was also an opportunity to present an award to 49 women for their leadership and community engagement. I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone for continuing to promote our beautiful French language in all of its diversity. Thank you. Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. I rise today in solidarity with those honouring March 21st as the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. It was on this day in 1960, the Sharpeville Massacre claimed the lives of 69 black people murdered by the police during a peaceful demonstration against the past system in apartheid South Africa. In Hamilton, we have a long legacy of community-wide human rights activism. I am especially proud to congratulate my sister, an MPP-elect, Sarah Jama, who is an ardent anti-racism organizer for winning a decisive victory in the by-election in Hamilton Centre. Today, I would like to recognize the tireless efforts led by my brother, Darren Green, who, with USW Hamilton Steelworkers Council and alongside HCCI, HARC, ACA, CCAR, the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, the Hamilton Black uh, History Council, with dozens of other local organizations over the past decade who continue to come together on this day to honor the victims of racial discrimination and continue in our pledge to fight to see it eliminated. Thank here, you. Here, here, here. Once again, I want to remind everyone that SO31s are taking place, and we all want to hear the messages that are coming across. The Honourable Member, l'Honorable Député. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, filmmaker Claude Fournier died last week at the age of 91. He was a monument to our culture and a pioneer of the history of our film and television. He was part of a generation of filmmakers who started the direct cinema style, which is a very a, a contribution to film that is very typical of Quebec. He also made a number of comedies with titles like Hot Dog and La Pomme, La Queue et les Pépins. These were all huge box office hits. But he didn't just stick to that genre. He also made the remarkable film Les Tisserands du Pouvoir and TV shows like Juliette Pomerleau and Félix Leclerc. He was truly a Renaissance man. He even made an English language film Alien Thunder with Donald Sutherland. He is leaving behind his partner, Marie-José Raymond, who worked closely with him, as well as his twin brother, a well-known figure in the TV industry in Quebec, Guy Fournier. Our sincere condolences. Thank you for everything, Claude Fournier. The Honourable Member for Simcoe Gray. Mr. Speaker, no matter what your diet is, we all want tasty, fresh, and sustainable food at prices that we can afford and ensures a fair living to those who produce it. As parliamentarians, the least we should be doing is to make growing our food more affordable. But not all parties seem to be that way. In fact, the Liberals are slapping the punitive carbon tax on farmers to make it harder to farm and to make our food more expensive. When the Liberals are done, a 5,000-acre farm will pay $150,000 per year in carbon taxes alone. Wow. Those costs will be passed on to regular Canadians. But don't worry, the NDP leader will blame it all on the grocery stores. At a time of food insecurity and food inflation at 40-year high, the family farm is increasingly unsustainable. But the high-tax Liberal NDP coalition will keep increasing taxes because that's what those parties do. Only Conservatives will cancel the tax and help farmers to keep growing. On March 25th, Greeks across Canada and around the world will celebrate Greek Independence Day. It's the day that marks the beginning of the Greek War of Independence, the start of the revolution which would allow the people of Greece to regain their freedom after 400 years of Ottoman occupation. On this day in 1821, the words Eleftheria y Thanatos, freedom or death, became the slogan of the nation, and brave men and women fought courageously for a better future for their country, for a liberated Greece. 
de revolucionarios. Revolutionaries like Theodoros Kolokotronis, Las Carina Bubalina, and Rigas Frayos, who wrote, It is better to live a single hour as a free man than 40 years as a slave and prisoner. It is thanks to the heroes of 1821 that Greeks are still around today to thrive in communities around the world. We remember them, we march in their honor, and tonight the Canada Greece Parliamentary Friendship Group will host a reception on Parliament Hill to celebrate the occasion. Zito Yelava, Zito Canavas, Zito Iquos Tipemti Martiu to Hilia Octacosa Iquosiana. Bravo. Bravo. Oral questions, question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Le Premier ministre a recul the Prime Minister has changed his mind after weeks of pressure from the Conservative Party to allow one, just one, of his assistants to... Uh, bear witness on Beijing's assistance to the Liberal Party over the past few elections. But now, the Prime Minister is delaying. The Prime Minister has proposed the name of a friend in order to draft a report that will take months. Will he finally unveil the camouflage and start an actual public inquiry starting today? The Right Honourable Prime Minister... Mr. Speaker, this is a very serious issue. It should not be a partisan one, and it should never be. That is the reason for which we have appointed an independent expert, David Johnson, in order to detect any issues in the system. With public recommendations, that could lead to an official investigation or another kind of independent oversight investigation. And we will follow up on these rec uh, recommendations. Two organizations will be studied with, and will study Chinese interference in our elections because we take this very seriously. It took weeks of pressure for the Prime Minister to back down and flip-flop, but allow only one of his top advisors, one of the key people who was involved in the campaigns that Beijing helped the Liberal Party win in multiple elections. But what we really need is the full truth. He's named his uh, neighbour, uh, family friend, ski buddy, and member of the Beijing Finance Trudeau Foundation to look into the matter, which is nothing more than a delay. Will he allow Canadians to get to the truth and prevent this from happening again before the next election with a full public inquiry now? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians know this is an extremely serious issue and should not be a partisan issue. That's why we named David Johnston as the independent expert to identify any gaps in our system. He will make public recommendations, which could include a formal inquiry or some other independent review process, and we will abide by those recommendations. Also have two national security bodies that will undertake independent reviews of foreign interference in our elections and are also taking further immediate action to bolster our institutions, better coordinate government efforts to combat interference, counter disinformation, and move forward on a foreign influence registry. Serve the opposition. Well, data today shows that food prices are exploding. Anyone who's been to a grocery store already knew it. But what is the Prime Minister's solution? He wants to raise taxes on the farmers that produce our food and the truckers that ship it, which means more expensive groceries at the grocery store. It's part of his plan to triple, triple, triple the tax on heat, gas, and groceries. The Prime Minister loves to jet around at other people's expense, burning fossil fuels. Will he show some decency and some compassion for the people he's harmed and cancel this April 1st tax hike? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when I sat down with farmers a few weeks ago to hear their concerns and to talk with them about how we're moving forward, they expressed to me their real concerns and, quite frankly, their leadership in the fight against climate change and their leadership on protecting the environment. Uh, and that's why I underline to them and to all Canadians uh, that uh, the leader of the opposition is simply wrong in his approach uh, on, on not fighting climate change. The price on pollution puts more money back in the pockets of Canadians while keeping our air clean. Indeed, a family of four in the opposition leader's riding received over $185 from our government in January, thanks to the Climate Action Incentive. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. 
$185 won't even cover a week's groceries for the average family after food prices have exploded under this Prime Minister. If he thinks our farmers are doing such a great job fighting climate change as I do, then why does he have to tax them again? Yeah. Uh, with a big tax, fat tax hike on April 1st. It's worse. It's not just food he's taxing. He wants to increase home heating costs and gas prices, a full 14 cents a litre tax, a tax that he wants to triple, triple, triple. Will he cancel his planned April 1st tax hike so that Canadians can afford to eat, heat and house themselves? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, again, uh, as of April, the uh, carbon, uh, the climate action incentive uh, will uh, increase uh, in the member opposites uh, riding. They will, a Canadian's family of four will receive $244 in his riding. Uh, we've made that because even as we move forward on putting a price on pollution, we are putting more money back in the pockets of Canadian families because Canadian families know that we do have to fight climate change while making sure things are more affordable. That's why we stepped up on issues like dental care and rental care, two issues that the Conservatives voted against. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Now he calls single mothers polluters because they buy groceries. He calls farmers polluters because they use fuel. He calls seniors polluters because they heat their homes. This from a guy who we just found out, one of his four government-funded mansions spent $8,000 a month what? on utilities to heat the pool and the sauna. He flew 17 times in one month, including one 10-minute flight, because he didn't want to drive an hour from Waterloo to Toronto. Wow. Why doesn't the Prime Minister stop his high-carbon, high-tax hypocrisy That's and right. cancel this tax? Yeah. Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, Canadians are facing challenging times right now because of incredibly challenging global contexts. Uh, whether it's the war in Ukraine, whether it's the end of the pandemic and disruptions of supply chain, uh, there are lots of issues and inflation facing Canadians right now. But instead of offering solutions, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, plays up partisan personal attacks. On this side of the House, we're focused on delivering for Canadians, delivering a GST rebate that helped uh, 11 million Canadians last fall, delivering rental benefits and dental care that Conservatives voted against. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to be there for Canadians while he plays. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. Mr. Speaker, all opposite parties want a public and independent inquiry. And so, a majority here in the House of Commons wants this. A number of experts have re recommended this, including Mr. Rosenberg. There is a large consensus in civil society for such a commission to be struck. And uh, intelligence agencies have raised serious issues. I don't understand, and I would like the Prime Minister to tell us very clearly why sh should this inquiry not be called right here, right now, with a commissioner appointed by this House. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians expect us to take this very seriously, and that is exactly what we have done. We have appointed an independent expert, David Johnson, our former Governor-General, in order to detect any issue in the system. This rapporteur will make recommendations, public recommendations, that could include an official inquiry or any other type of independent study, pursuant to his reckoning of what is necessary. We will follow these recommendations. What is more? Two national security agencies will conduct their own investigations with regards to foreign interference and will continue to take this seriously. The Honourable Member for Belleau Chambly. So I have two, three notions when it comes to independence. I kind of know what independence is, but uh, this uh, new rapporteur is about as independent as I am federalist. The head of the, pro of the United States will be here on Friday. So isn't it weird? to communicate when it comes to national safety for the whole of the North American continent. Isn't it a weird message to send, this non-creation of a commission? I'm not accusing the Prime Minister of anything, but why not take this golden opportunity to uh, stop this impression that he has something to hide? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr Speaker, Canadians must have trust in our electoral system and in our democracy. And that is the reason for which we have appointed David Johnson, a former Governor General, as an independent expert. We are very pleased to announce that his mandate was made public this morning. David Johnson isn't partisan. He is a patriot, a patriot, a Canadian who has always put Canada before any other consideration. An admirable Governor General appointed by a Conservative politician. We reject unfounded accusations against someone who has f served Canada so well. Well, I would like my colleague to explain why he said that he was Federalist as another question. Did, uh, do Democrats care deeply about democracy and are deeply concerned about political interference in our system? That's why we force this government to end the obstruction in committee and to allow the Chief of Staff of the Prime Minister to testify, rendering the Conservative motion useless, which is not surprising because they just want to play games. In fact, they are right now, the Conservative Party, blocking our motion to have a vote in this House on a public inquiry. So my question to the Conservative leader, why is he playing games? What does he have to hide? Why won't he stand up? If I can just add a small comment, I just want to remind question, the honourable members what question period is about. It's about the opposition holding government to account, not discussing amongst themselves. The right honourable Prime Minister. Uh, please to be able to stand up to uh, reinforce what uh, our, my honourable parliamentary colleague pointed out, uh, that the Conservative leader and indeed Conservative parliamentarians uh, seem to be more focused on playing partisan games uh, and personal attacks than they are on actually seeing Canadians reassured about the state of our democracy and uh, the tools we have to counter foreign interference. Uh, but that's exactly why we chose to move forward with an unimpeachable expert, our former Governor General, uh, David Johnston, uh, who is going to uh, look deeply and seriously with a uh, wide and deep mandate uh, released this morning uh, to reassure Canadians that all is being done to protect our democracy. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. You know, I think I figured it out. It turns out the Liberals and the Conservatives both have something in common. They're both opposed to a public inquiry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they yeah. don't Canadians deserve a public inquiry because foreign interference undermines confidence in our democracy. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South from the top, please. From the top. Go ahead, one more time. It turns out that i got to repeat this again because it's so important. It looks like the Liberals and the Conservatives both have something in common. They're both opposed to a public inquiry. Canadians deserve a public inquiry because foreign interference undermines confidence in our democracy and undermines confidence in our electoral system. My question to the Prime Minister, why this waste of time? Why won't the Prime Minister call a public inquiry right here and right now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, we know full well, and we know all full well, that issues such as delicate as national security cannot simply always be discussed publicly, and that is why we have appointed appointed an independent rapporteur, Mr Johnson, who will dig to the very bottom of things in a non-partisan and independent way with a public inquiry if he decides that this is the way to move forward. On top of this, there's a, there's a committee of parliamentarians with a sufficiently high clearance level that can fully examine, examine and report to this House on national security matters. We will continue to work seriously. Alton Hills. <laughs> Mr Speaker, to the Prime Minister. According to reports in the Globe and Mail, around the time of the 2021 federal election, CSIS outlined a sophisticated strategy to disrupt our democracy and back the re-election of the Liberal Party and the Liberal government. Has the Prime Minister ever been briefed on the activities of Beijing or its affiliates in support of the Liberal Party in any election 
and if so, when? The Honourable uh, Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I hope all members will appreciate that this government takes allegations of foreign interference very seriously, which is why we appointed independent panels made up of non-partisan professional public servants who certified that the elections in 2019 and 2021 were free and fair. We've received recommendations from those panels, which we're now implementing. Last week, we took the additional step of appointing David Johnston, former Governor General appointed by Stephen Harper, a man with impeccable uh, qualifications to do the job, who will now provide recommendations up to and including a public inquiry to ensure that we protect all of our democratic institutions. Right. Well, member for Wellington, Holton Hills. Mr. Speaker, these are serious questions that I think the public deserves real answers to. So I'll ask another question that I hope the government can answer. CSIS documents obtained by the Globe and Mail suggest that Beijing's consulate in Vancouver took credit for the defeat of at least two Conservative candidates in the 2021 election. Was the Prime Minister or any other member of the government ever briefed on Conservative candidates being targeted by Beijing successfully or unsuccessfully? And if so, when? The Honourable Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, our Honourable colleague knows very well that our government, unlike the previous Conservative government, immediately took steps to strengthen mm -hmm. Canadian democratic institutions from the ongoing threat of foreign interference, which CSIS identified. My colleague likes to report CSIS, quote CSIS reports. In 2013, Mr. Speaker, yep. when the current leader of the opposition was responsible for democratic institutions, CSIS identified the growing threat of foreign interference, yep. and the previous Conservative government did absolutely nothing. And in fact, they brag about it because it didn't affect the Conservative Party, so they didn't decide to do anything about it. The Honourable Member for St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, we know that the Prime Minister was frequently briefed about Beijing's in election interference. In the face of that, this is what a CSIS whistleblower wrote in the Globe and Mail. Quote, months passed and then years the threat grew in urgency and serious action remained unforthcoming, end of quote. That is an indictment on the record of this Prime Minister. Beijing interfered in two elections under this Prime Minister's watch and he turned a blind eye to it. Why? <laughs> the Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Nothing could be further from the truth. Since we've taken the reins of government, this government has been proactive, consistently proactive, in taking foreign interference seriously by giving CSIS new threat reduction measure powers, by ensuring that we crack down on foreign funding, which could be used to meddle in our elections through the introduction and passage of Bill C-76, through the creation of the National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians that sees all recognized parties do the important work to together to protect our democratic institutions. That is the record of this government. I'm proud of it, and we will continue to ensure that we do everything possible to protect. The Honourable Member for St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, no charges have been laid. No diplomats have been expelled. The Prime Minister kept Canadians in the dark, and it took a CSIS whistleblower to make the public aware of Beijing's election interference. That's the record of this Prime Minister. Either the Prime Minister was completely asleep at the switch, or he allowed it to happen because it benefited the Liberal Party. Which is it? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our colleague should be careful not to make outrageous allegations that he knows very well have no basis in the truth. Mr. Speaker, our government, from the beginning, took the issue of foreign interference very seriously. We put in place a number of steps, including a National Security and Intelligence Committee of Parliamentarians created by law, Mr. Speaker, with access to all of the relevant documents and officials to make assessments about this and other national security issues. Far from what my colleague is saying, we have taken this issue seriously from the very beginning and continue to do so. The Honourable Member, the Honourable Deputy de Mégantic-Lérable. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, a whistleblower risked his uh, job by unveiling Beijing's role in our elections. What will happen to my family if I go to prison, he said. 
This is someone who is responsible for our national security, and he is aware of the consequences of his actions. All this because the Prime Minister did absolutely nothing to stop Beijing interference in the last two elections. It's for national security. Someone is ready to go to prison for the truth. Why has the Prime Minister closed his eyes for so long? The Honourable Minister for Inter Parliamentary Affairs, Mr Speaker, my colleague knows full well that the Prime Minister and our government, on the contrary, took very seriously from the very beginning this very important issue, that is, to strengthen our democratic institutions here in Canada against China's interference and the interference of other countries. This is not a new phenomenon in Canada or in other countries in this world. Mr Speaker, the good news is that we have implemented measures that have strengthened our democratic institutions, and we will continue to work, including with the, right, the Honourable former Governor-General David Johnson. CSIS stated that the Prime Minister was informed a number of times that there was a Beijing interference in our elections. The whistleblower said over the past few months and over the past years this has become an emergency. Tangible measures have never been tabled and enacted. I've tried to raise the issue directly with my supervisors and those who make decisions in order to send this up the chain of command, but they were incapable of doing so and acting. Why has the Prime Minister ignored these warnings? The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, our colleague knows full well that we didn't ignore these warning signs. That's what the former Conservative government did back in the day. They ignored it. We did qu quite the opposite. We implemented a number of measures in order to strengthen democratic institutions, in order to share with parliamentarians what essential information is required for national security and national safety. We have a committee of independent experts presided by the clerk of the Privy Council that certified that 2019 and 2021 elections were free and democratic. But the good news is that we will continue to do even more to strengthen these measures. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr Speaker, the debate over Chinese interference in our democracy demonstrates the Prime Minister's systematic and historic lack of ethics. He has threatened a confidence, uh, no confidence vote in the media to avoid a committee appearance by his Chief of Staff, Katie Telford. In other words, he threatened to force an election, nothing less. Rather than have to tell the truth about the information he has long had about Chinese interference. So, Mr. Speaker, what is it that the Prime Minister doesn't want to hear Ms. Telford admit so much so that he is thinking of toppling his own government? The Honourable Leader of the Government in the House. That's wrong. It is our objective to make sure that we have the witnesses necessary to answer questions. We want to make sure that they are available. There are many ministers that have already appeared before the committee. There will be a number of uh, interveners at this committee, and we will make sure that all questions will have someone there for an answer. The Honourable Member for Trois-Rivières. Mr Speaker, just imagine, we know that China heavily interfered in the last two elections. The Prime Minister has threatened to call another election with a vote of no confidence. Even before the details of China's meddling practices have been investigated, before the electoral system has been tightened and strengthened to counteract these illegal practices, the Prime Minister has threatened to call a new election, even if it means Beijing can use the same tricks a third time in a row. That's a hat trick, Mr Speaker. When will there be a public and independent commission of inquiry? the Honourable Minister for National Heritage. Mr Speaker, my colleague isn't playing in a field of truth. He doesn't want to work with facts. The Prime Minister has said nothing about, uh, nothing about a no-confidence vote. It is clear if the blood can... wants to hinder our job, then perhaps they could find this clear if the truth. He doesn't want to work with facts. The Prime Minister has said nothing about 
uh, nothing about a no-confidence vote. It is clear, if the Bloc Québécois only wants to try and f pick a fight, only wants to cause a nuisance, only wants to hinder our job, then perhaps they could finally turn to the facts instead of just making stuff up. The Honourable Member for Longueuil Saint-Hubert. Mr. Speaker, while the Liberals are playing election threats, in the real world, there are real people in the Chinese community who are facing real threats from the very real Chinese regime. You know, Mr. Speaker, the famous Chinese police stations in Canada, well, yesterday, Safeguard Defender confirmed that 83 Canadian citizens already have been arrested and deported to China to face trial. 83, Mr. Speaker. And those are just the known cases. Beijing is arresting Canadian citizens in Canada right under the Prime Minister's nose. This is serious. When will the Prime Minister finally launch a real public and independent commission of inquiry? The Honourable Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So we will always make sure that our position on China is clear, and it is clear. We will never tolerate any form of interference here in Canada in our democracy or in our internal affairs. And I think it's important that all colleagues understand that we will always distinguish between the Chinese government and the Chinese population. Unfortunately, Canadians of Chinese origin are far too often targeted. I ask all members in this House to support Canadians of Chinese origin in every riding throughout the country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Brentford, Brent. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and his loyal Liberal caucus keep trying to distract, divide and cover up their failure to protect Canadians from foreign interference. Canadians deserve to know the truth about Beijing's interference in our elections. We need to learn exactly what the Prime Minister knew and what was done to defend our democracy. Will the Prime Minister finally identify all 11, all 11 federal candidates who receive funding from Beijing? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. My colleague and all members in this chamber that we take foreign interference very seriously, which is why we have put in the people, the authorities, the resources, the technology to protect all of our institutions, including most especially our elections. And that is why last week we appointed Mr. Johnston, a former Governor General appointed by Stephen Harper, no less, Mr. Speaker, someone who is unimpeachable and who has the ability to put forward concrete recommendations, including and up to a public inquiry, which, if he does, this government will respect because we take the work of protecting our democratic institutions very seriously and we are committed to, con to con continue doing that. Thank you. For Brantford Brent. That isn't the truth that Canadians expect. Just recently, Global News revealed that two high-level national security reports before and after the 2019 election suggest the Prime Minister's office was warned about Chinese government officials and the direct funding they were given to Liberal candidates. However, the Prime Minister continues to express that the information was never shared with him directly. The question now is simple. Who in the Prime Minister's office deliberately and intentionally withheld the information from him, and will he be terminating that person, yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, this is a government that believes in taking foreign interference with the utmost seriousness, which is why we have raised the bar when it comes to being transparent in how we are doing that work through the creation of NCCOP, through the creation of the National Security Intelligence Review Agency. And now with Mr. Johnston's appointment as the Special Rapporteur, he will put forward the next best practical steps so that we can continue to reinforce our democratic institutions, including our elections. Mr. Speaker, this is not a partisan issue. It is one that all members should unite behind, and I hope that that will include the Conservatives as well. Honourable Member for Lethbridge. We see this over and over again. Skirt, deflect, skirt, deflect, skirt, deflect. At the end of the day, I find this all very perplexing. We know that there have been reports given by CSIS to the Prime Minister's office. Somehow, those reports did not make it to the Prime Minister's ears. At least that's what he tells us. So our question for the Prime Minister is, wasn't he even just a little bit curious as to who those individuals are that withheld that information from him? I mean, wouldn't he want to know? Or did he already know and simply didn't need to ask? Here, here. Here, here. The Honourable Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, the mandate that has been given to Mr. Johnston will allow him to look into all of the questions and the concerns that have been raised around the elections in 2019 and 2021, uh, also highlighting the fact that two independent panels have already verified that those elections were free and fair. Now Mr. Johnston will continue to work uh, with all parliamentarians, will work with the committees and bodies who have uh, and are charged with the responsibility of protecting our national security so that we can shine a light on the way in which we protect our elections, and that is precisely what this government is focused on. I hope Conservatives will join in that effort. This is not a partisan issue. It's a... The Honourable Member for Sherbrooke Haute Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, the media has reported that CSIS informed the Prime Minister's bureau that Liberal candidates were receiving money and support from Beijing and that nothing was done about it. Does the Prime Minister really th think that Canadians believe that he did not require answers from the people who hid that information? Is it because he already knew that that was happening? The Honourable Member for, part for Intergovernmental Affairs. Mr. Speaker, my colleague knows full well that from the very outset, our government took the threat of foreign interference very seriously. That is why we set up a number of measures that were confirmed by the panel of uh, senior officials overseen by the clerk of the Privy Council that the elections of 2019 and 2021 were free and fair. And we have strengthened those measures, and now Mr. Johnston will be analyzing the situation and making recommendations, and if there are other measures that we must implement to continue to make sure that there is no foreign interf interference, then... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now that New Democrats have forced an end to the government filibuster at committee and secured the testimony of his chief of staff, I think we owe it to Canadians to make a little more time in this place to talk about the issues that are affecting them in the pocketbook, like grocery prices, for instance, that even as inflation begins to slow, Grocery prices continue to rise at an outpaced rate, Mr. Speaker, and grocery companies are walking away with all of that in profit while Canadians are cash strapped. The solution is to impose a windfall tax on the grocery companies that are overcharging Canadians further groceries for a clear signal that they won't get to walk away with that money and that money will be reinvested in Canadians who are staring down the barrel of a recession. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Thank the Honourable Member for his question. And as he will know, the inflation rate today for February was posted at 5.2%. That is still too high, and we're going to continue to support Canadians who need the support when they need it the most. And in our country, tax fairness is a fundamental principle of our tax fairness. That's why we insisted that the insurance companies and banks pay more with the Canada uh, recovery dividend, Mr. Speaker, 1.5% more on, on income over a billion dollars. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to watch very closely what the grocery companies are doing, and we'll continue to be there fighting on the side of Canadians. Good job. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, the IPCC just gave another dire warning. If we don't act now, the devastating consequences of the climate crisis will only get worse. President Biden just announced a budget that eliminates billions of dollars in U.S. fossil fuel subsidies and invests that money in the low carbon economy. This is what leadership looks like. Other countries are stepping up to the plate, but the Liberals want to keep giving billions to rich oil and gas CEOs. Will the Liberals stop dragging Canada backwards and finally end fossil fuel subsidies? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, after a decade of complete inaction by the opposition when they were in government, we are showing that leadership. The IPCC is right. Climate change is real. Climate change is urgent. And we are taking action. That's why we need to continue doing what we are doing. We put a price on carbon pollution. We put an emissions reductions plan that speaks to how we're going to reduce emissions across all sectors of our economy. And we have committed to ending all fossil fuel subsidies for unabated fossil fuels. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Mr. Speaker, it's been now over a year since Russia began its devastating further full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And it's important to remember that this invasion is not just a threat to Ukraine's security, but to Canada's national security, to NATO, and to countries around the world. Despite Putin's war crimes, despite his unrelenting aggression today, Ukraine stands strong. In my view, Canada's military aid, including our training of Ukrainian armed forces, has played an essential role in Ukraine's progress on the ground. Could the Minister of National Defence share with Canadians the impact she believes Canada's training has had 
on the ground, on the battlefield in Ukraine. The Honourable Minister of National Defence. Mr. Speaker, since 2015, the Canadian Armed Forces have trained over 35,000 members of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. We are training Ukrainians in England. We are training Ukrainian engineers in Poland, and we are tra training them on the use of the Leopard 2A4 battle tank. As President von der Leyen said, the Canadian Armed Forces have been instrumental in terms of the resilience that is being shown on the battlefield in Ukraine. And we stand with Ukraine as it fights for its democracy, its sovereignty, and its stability. Thank you, Mr. Bravo. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Mr. Speaker, after eight long years of this tax and spend Liberal Prime Minister, many Canadians are sinking in debt. They cannot afford food. They cannot afford heat and they cannot afford shelter. And on April 1st this year, these Liberals are determined to make life even more difficult for struggling Canadians by increasing the carbon tax. Yay. It's more money out of their pockets. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are spent. When will this government cancel this cruel and callous carbon tax? Yes. The Honourable Minister for National Resources. As uh, I have said a number of times in the House, affordability is extremely important to every member and every party in this House. We have taken significant steps, including doubling of the GST tax credit, enhancement of the workers' benefit, investments in energy efficiency, and a number of other things to address affordability issues. With respect to the price on pollution, 8 out of 10 Canadian families get more money back with respect to the price on pollution than they pay. It is, in effect, an affordability measure itself. Canadians expect their politicians to be smart and thoughtful to address affordability issues, but yes, to also believe in and address climate change. Yes. Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Mr. Speaker, that empty answer is not giving any reassurances to struggling Canadians like John and Judy in my riding. They're just one senior couple among many who built this country. And how does this government repay them? They increase the tax on their already ludicrously high heating bill by nearly 20%. This Prime Minister needs to stand up today and justify this unnecessary and completely avoidable tax hike to John, Judy and the countless other Canadians suffering under this carbon tax. The Honourable Minister for Seniors. To my colleague, we won't take any lessons from the party opposite, whose plan for seniors was to raise the age of retirement to 67. First thing we did, Mr. Speaker, we re restored that back to 65. Here, here. And unlike the party opposite, Mr. Speaker, we have been investing in seniors by increasing their old age security, uh, by increasing their guaranteed income supplement. Mr. Speaker, all the measures which the party opposed. Mr. Speaker, we've had the backs of seniors before, and we're going to continue to make sure we support here, seniors. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Mr. Speaker, after eight Eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadians have never been more indebted. Wasteful government spending has driven up the cost of heating, of housing and of food. We know that Canadians can no longer food feed themselves because food banks are overwhelmed. And in fact, in a recent visit to a community food bank in my, in my riding, I was shocked to see people were lined up out the door to get food. On April 1st, it's going to get worse because this Liberal government, completely tone deaf, is going to increase the carbon tax. When will this Prime Minister finally get out of the way and so we can fix what he broke? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Families. Speaker, first of all, it's Canadians who decide who's in government and not Conservative members of Parliament. But let's be clear that 2.7 million Canadians fewer are in poverty today than when the Conservatives were in government. And Mr. Speaker, when it comes to supporting Canadians, we've been there, whether it's supporting children with the Canada Child Benefit, whether it's supporting seniors with the Guaranteed Income Supplement, an increase to the GIS, or an increase to old age security for those who are over 75, or the Canada Workers Benefit. And in fact, when it comes to supporting food banks, Mr. Speaker, our government has been there, and we're there through the Community Support Services Recovery Fund. We're going to be there for Canadians, and we're going to be there for the organizations. Of for Northumberland, Peterborough South. I would sincerely invite this member to come down to the Coburg Food Bank food share and meet with these individuals and tell them that life has never been so good because that's just not here, true. Here. The truth of the matter is here, here, here. this government is incompetent at fighting the affordability crisis as they are at climate change. They fail to eat every tire car target. They continue to make life more and more expensive for Canadians. When will this Prime Minister finally get out of the way so we can fix what they exactly. broke? Here, here. The Honourable Member of Sport. 
Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives are concerned about the situation of Canadians, and if they are as concerned as we are, then they should explain that each time it's time to help Canadians who are the hardest off, they oppose it. When we offered a $500 supplement to Canadians that are having a hard time paying their rent, the Conservatives voted against it. And when we eliminated permanently the federal interests on student loans, the, the Conservatives voted against it. So I think they should explain to Canadians why they refuse to help Canadians in their hard times. The Honourable Member for jean -Pierre. Mr. Speaker, the ink is not even dry on the agreement on health transfers, and the federal government is already making cuts. The government has announced $82 million in health care cuts, 50 percent of which will affect Quebec. So Ottawa is taking $41 million out of our health care system. Mr. Speaker, the minister must know that there is a crisis everywhere in our health care centres. Right now, in La Chine, the emergency room has been partially closed since February. In the Udawe region, the emergency room occupancy rate is at 200 percent. How can anyone be heartless enough to think that it is time to cut back on health care right now? The Honourable Member for the, the Honourable Health Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am sure that my colleague, like all colleagues in this House, agree uh, that uh, Canadians must receive health care based on need and not based on uh, the capacity to pay. The Health Act is clear. It gives us access to health care. And uh, we know uh, that it covers people who do not have the means to pay for them. And we are going to continue that all Canadians have access to high-quality health care for free. The member for Jean Pierre. Mr. Speaker, uh, the federal government is uh, doing something completely unacceptable. Quebec has not received a penny from the forest agreement on health transfers yet, and we because we have to wait for the money to be budgeted by Ottawa. But the minister is already cutting. Not only is he barely meeting one sixth of Quebec's health care needs in the agreement, but it's He's cutting $41 million already. Is there someone on the other side of the House that, with enough judgment to understand that this doesn't make sense? The Honourable Member, uh, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased to inform my colleague that the uh, government of uh, Quebec, Mr. Dubé, and uh, myself are working together to make sure that in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada that access to essential diagnostics re remains free. And really... It is a matter of making sure uh, that this uh, happens everywhere. We have been working with British Columbia. Be we know uh, that the funds of Canada ensure that everyone throughout the country has access to free health care services everywhere, including Quebec. Mr. Speaker, this government's April 1st plan tax hike on alcohol is no joke for Canadian crop brewers. This buzz-killing tax will mean less jobs, fewer paychecks, and high beer prices for Canadians who already pay some of the highest beer prices in the whole world. Talk about hosing Canadians. Will this government help our buds make more suds and freeze the April 1st escalator tax on alcohol, or will it continue its brouhaha on job-killing, inflation-inducing tax hikes to Canadian craft brewers and Canadian consumers? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Notwithstanding, we understand, and I understand, as Minister of Tourism, the importance that the beer, wine, and spirits industry bring to our communities, to our microbreweries, to our very ridings. But, Mr. Speaker, let's be serious about serious matters. This escalator has been in place for a long time. It's about tax fairness, and what we're actually talking about, Mr. Speaker, is less than one cent per can of beer. That's what the federal amount is. Let's have the Conservatives talk about serious matters. And we will respond in a serious manner. Honourable Member for Lamb, Kent, Middlesex. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal Prime Minister, it's no secret that times are tough for Canadians. And on April 1st, our local breweries, distilleries, wineries and cideries will see a hit on the excise tax, a 6.3% increase on the excise tax, the greatest increase in 40 years. 46% of the cost of a beer is already taxed. And now the Liberals, well, they want Canadians to pay more. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister take responsibility for denying our hardworking Canadians an affordable drink and stop the tax? Tax increases. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister. Look at the facts. We 
be reduced and actually eliminated excise duty on low alcohol beer effective Jan July 1st, 2022, which makes our practices consistent with the G7. And Mr. Speaker, what the federal amount of this excise tax inflation increase represents is less than one penny per can of beer. That's what we're talking about, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has plunged Canadians into the worst inflation in 40 years, as if that wasn't enough. He is now attacking Canadian microbreweries. The excise ta tax on beer, wine and spirits is going to go up by 6.3% as of April 1st. This will hurt everyone from producer to consumer. After eight years under this Prime Minister, everything is going up. Could the Prime Minister curb his inflationary thirst because Canadians have had enough? The Honourable Member of for Tourism. Minister of Tourism. So with regard to the excise task, we know that we are bringing it up to the level for all G7 countries. So with regard to increasing the excise, tax, it means less than one cent per can of beer. Now, this has been on the books for a long time, Mr. Speaker, and we know that Canadians are going through hard times. That's why we have a whole series of measures to make life more affordable. The Honourable Member for Lac saint -Louis. According to recent studies, the number of Canadians suffering from dementia should reach a record number in by 2030. We know that throughout the pandemic, people with dementia and those who care for them were disproportionately affected. Last week, our government announced $68.3 million in research funding into aging and brain health. Can the Minister of Health tell this House how this investment will contribute to the health and well-being of people with dementia, their families and their caregivers? The Health Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague for Lake saint for his excellent work. Safety and wellness are critical to the quality of life of Canadians, particularly aging Canadians, and that is why uh, the National Strategy on Dementia will continue to improve the quality of life for people living with dementia, their families, and their caregivers. This funding will also support research on brain health linked to aging in order to support the latest areas of research because we know that a healthy brain is essential to a healthy life. Colchester. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, there are almost six million Canadians without access to primary care. In my province of Nova Scotia alone, there's 140,000 people almost who do not have access. Two days ago, the Conservatives over here introduced a Blue Seal program under which there will be a common standard for, for doctors trained else, elsewhere to gain license here in Canada. Canadians are beyond frustrated knowing that the doctors who have immigrated this, to this country are only to be left out in the cold. When will this Prime Minister admit his wrongdoings and take action on behalf of all Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Access to family health, even primary care in Canada, is indeed essential. I'm grateful for the question. And that is why I'm yeah, going I'm to send it. a copy of a letter that I sent to health ministers a couple of weeks ago to my is colleagues so that he sees why and how provinces and territories have already committed yeah. the national licensure for health professionals, including the recognition of foreign credentials for health workers in Canada. Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. Well, Mr. Speaker, perhaps that's too little too late because we know that this government promised 7,500 doctors, nurses and nurse practitioners and to date none have been delivered. This is in spite of the fact that there are more than 50,000 doctors and nurses in this Canada who are not, cho who are not working in their chosen pr profession. The Conservative Blue Seal program will allow internationally trained health professionals a clear pathway to licensure and a clear answer with respect to their credentials within 60 days of coming to Canada. Why has this government constantly and consistently betrayed qualified new Canadians and when will the Prime Minister take action? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. 
with regret and with respect, I would say that this is indeed a bit too late. We've done that just a few weeks ago. We've been working on that months ago and years ago. And that is why already in Canada this is happening, including in Atlantic Canada, in PEI, in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Ontario, British Columbia. We're making important and quick progress, obviously, with the collaboration of provinces and territories, so that people that come to Canada can quickly use their tools, their talents, their expertise to serve Canadians. The Honourable Member for Baltimore-Fashat-Cartier. Uh, the uh, Baltimore-Fashat-Cartier citizen received five envelopes containing kind of confidential documents from Passport Canada from Canadians in five different provinces, credit card numbers, passports, social insurance numbers. This is an alarming situation, Mr. Speaker, and Canadians' confidence is shaken. How many Canadians uh, were the victims in this situation? It's a good thing the envelope fell into the hands of an honest citizen. How can Canadians trust this Prime Minister when the Prime Minister's government can't even manage confidential documents? The Honourable Minister for Families, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this uh, situation is completely unacceptable, and I would like to thank uh, the um, member opposite for returning those documents and also thank the, the citizen involved. Well, as soon as I heard about this situation, I asked uh, the department to uh, conduct an investigation to ensure that it never happens again, and I would like to reassure the member that it is completely unacceptable and we are working uh, to solve it efficiently. Mills. Mr. Speaker, over a year ago, this government tabled Bill C-11, the online streaming app. Still, there is so much disinformation about how this legislation helps artists in my riding of Mississauga Erin Mills and across Canada, while also protecting the freedom of expression for Canadians. Can the Minister for Canadian Heritage please update the House on how this bill will make tech giants pay their fair share, celebrate the best of Canadian content, and serve the needs for all Canadians. The Minister for Canadian Heritage. Mr. So Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for her question, her great work. Excellent. The online streaming bill is very clear. It makes tech giants pay for their fair share to a Canadian culture, but some tech giants don't want to do that. So with their conservative friends, they're trying to make this about free speech. That's right. But it's written black and white in the bill. It has nothing to do with what people post online. It's about the biggest companies in the world contributing to our music, to our movies, to our television. It's about creating the next generation of great Canadian artists, so let's stand up for them, Mr. Speaker, and pass Bill C-11. The Honourable Member for Skeena Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, everyone knows the Liberals' air passenger protections aren't working. Even the Minister himself knows it. Now, he's promised new legislation this spring, but he hasn't consulted with any of the leading consumer advocacy groups on this issue. Shame. Well, he's in luck, because we did the work for him. And yesterday, I tabled a bill that finally protects air passengers and includes those groups' recommendations. Here, here. So the question to the Minister, will he do the right thing, steal our homework, and ensure that his government's third attempt at protecting air passengers actually works. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Transportation. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for his advocacy. He remembers uh, that in, in January of this year, I reached out to him and asked for his input as I am developing the framework for our government to table in this House of Commons. I have consulted with advocacy organizations, I've consulted stakeholders in the industry, and I am looking forward because, Mr. Speaker, it is our government who's put in place the Passenger Bill of Rights, and it is our government that will strengthen and clarify the Passenger Bill of Rights. The Honourable Member for Churchill, Kuwetnuk Aski. Mr. Speaker, First Nations in our region are in crisis, and the government is missing in action. In God's River, God's Lake Narrows, and Oxford House, drugs are destroying people's lives. In God's River, the RCMP took up to two and a half days to respond to a serious incident. There's a housing crisis, a cost of living crisis, an unemployment crisis. First Nations leaders and members on the ground are clear. They have never seen it this bad. What will it take for this government to act on the humanitarian crisis that is destroying families and First Nations right now? 
The Honorable Minister. Mr. Speaker, uh, recently I visited God's Lake and I can tell you that the member is right, that we have to do more together to protect members of that community and all communities, Mr. Speaker, that are struggling under the weight of a colonial system that has not invested in their prosperity. Whether we're talking about economic reconciliation, Mr. Speaker, closing the infrastructure gap, ensuring that people have equity to education, which, by the way, Mr. Mr. Speaker, our government has actually acted on. This is the work that we must do together as Canadians, Mr. Mr. Speaker, because in this country, everyone deserves a fair chance to succeed. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for question period today. It being 3.13, pursuant to order made on Thursday, June 23rd, 2022, the House will now proceed to the taking of the deferred, deferred recorded division on the motion of Mr. Cooper relating to the business of supply. Thank you. Mr. Cooper, seconded by Mr. Dowdle, moved that the that given the many reports of foreign interference, and may I dispense? No, I don't think I heard dispense. That give that given many reports of foreign interference in Canada's democratic process by or on behalf of the communist regime in Beijing, the Standing Committee on Access to Information, Privacy and Ethics be empowered and instructed to study all aspects for of foreign interference in relation to the 2019 and 2021 general election, including preparation for those may I dispense. Thank you. The 10-minute electronic voting period has commenced. The House will now proceed to the taking of votes for members participating in person. Of the motion will please rise. Mr. Shear. Mr. Doherty. Mr. Doherty. Mr. Kimmich. Mr. Kimmich. Mrs. Thomas. Mrs. Thomas. Mr. Deltel. Mr. Deltel. Mrs. Stubbs. Mrs. Stubbs. Mr. Polis. Mr. Polis. Ms. Lansman. Ms. Lansman. Mr. Halon. Mr. Halon. Ms. Lewis Haldeman Norfolk. Ms. Lewis Haldeman Norfolk. Mr. Straw. Mr. Straw. Ms. Dancho. Ms. Dancho. Mrs. Gray. Mrs. Gray. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Mr. Baldinelli. Mr. Baldinelli. Mr. Mazier. Mr. Mazier. Mr. Lewis Essex. Mr. Lewis Essex. Mr. Jenis. Mr. Jenis. Mr. Seaback. Mr. Seaback. Mr. Small. Mr. Small. Mr. Ellis. Mr. Ellis. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Stewart. Mr. Bertol. Mr. Bertol. Mr. Duncan Stormont Dunda, South Glengarry. Mr. Duncan Stormont Dunda, South Glengarry. Mr. Workington. Mr. Workington. Mr. Abultaev. Mr. Abultaev. Mr. Chong. Mr. Chong. Mrs. Cousy. Mrs. Cousy. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Ms. Ferrari. Ms. Ferrari. Mr. Schmail. Mr. Schmail. Mr. Vidal. Mr. Vidal. Mr. Perkins. Mr. Perkins. Mr. Davidson. Mr. Davidson. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Viss. Mr. Viss. Mr. Calkins. Mr. Calkins. Mr. Lloyd. Mr. Lloyd. Ms. Rude. Ms. Rude. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper. Mr. Martel. Monsieur Martel. Mr. Bertol. Monsieur Godin. Monsieur Godin. Miss Gladu. Miss Gladu. Mr. Williams. Mr. Williams. Mrs. Goodridge. Mrs. Goodridge. Mr. Malillo. Mr. Malillo. Mrs. Cramp Nyman. Mrs. Cramp Nyman. Mrs. Vecchio. Mrs. Vecchio. Mr. Chambers. Mr. Chambers. Mrs. Block. Mrs. Block. Mr. Aitchison. Mr. Aitchison. Mr. Van Popta. Mr. Van Popta. Mr. Lobb. Mr. Lobb. Mr. Kitchen. Mr. Kitchen. Mr. Muse. Mr. Muse. Mr. Redekop. Mr. Redekop. Mr. Brock. Mr. Brock. Mr. Waugh. Mr. Waugh. Mr. Steinley. Mr. Steinley. Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Hoback. Mr. Hoback. Mr. Lehou. Mr. Lehou. Mr. Genereux. Mr. Genereux. 
Mrs. Falk, Battleford Lloyd Minster. Mrs. Falk, Battleford Lloyd Minster. Mr. Morantz. Mr. Morantz. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Madame Vien. Madame Vien. Mr. Gould. Mr. Gould. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Brassard. Mr. Brassard. Mr. Williamson. Mr. Williamson. Mr. McGuire. Mr. McGuire. Ms. Rumpel Garner. Ms. Rumpel Garner. Mr. Cram. Mr. Cram. Mrs. Wagenthal. Mrs. Wagenthal. Mr. Dreeshin. Mr. Dreeshin. Mr. Couric. Mr. Couric. Mr. Nader. Mr. Nader. Mr. Tolmy. Mr. Tolmy. Mr. Allison. Mr. Allison. Mr. Carey. Mr. Carey. Mr. McLean. Mr. McLean. Mrs. Gallant. Mrs. Gallant. Mr. Shipley. Mr. Shipley. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed. Mr. Jenneru. Mr. Jenneru. Mr. Patzer. Mr. Patzer. Mr. Macaulay Edmonton West. Mr. Macaulay Edmonton West. Mr. Falk Provence. Mr. Falk Provence. Mr. Lake. Mr. Lake. Mr. Dantremont. Mr. Dantremont. Mr. Morrison. Mr. Morrison. Mr. Dowdell. Mr. Dowdell. Mr. Dalton. Mr. Dalton. Mr. Bragdon. Mr. Bragdon. Mr. Epp. Mr. Epp. Mr. Motts. Mr. Motts. Mr. Weber. Mr. Weber. Mr. Soroka. Mr. Soroka. Mr. Vierson. Mr. Vierson. Mr. Ruff. Mr. Ruff. Mr. Shields. Mr. Shields. Mr. Leipert. Mr. Leipert. Mr. Fast. Mr. Fast. Mr. Blanchet. Monsieur Blanchet. Monsieur Terrien. Monsieur Terrien. Madame Normandin. Madame Normandin. Monsieur Simard. Monsieur Simard. Madame Gill. Madame Gill. Madame de Bellefeuille. Madame de Bellefeuille. Monsieur Fortin. Monsieur Fortin. Monsieur Brunel du Cep. Monsieur Brunel du Cep. Monsieur Villemur. Monsieur Villemur. Madame Larouche. Madame Larouche. Monsieur Barcelou Duval. Monsieur Barcelou Duval. Monsieur Plamondon. Monsieur Plamondon. Monsieur Savard Tremblay. Monsieur Savard Tremblay. Madame Posé. Madame Posé. Monsieur Lemire. Monsieur Le Mire. Madame Sinclair de Gagné. Madame Sinclair de Gagné. Monsieur Trudel. Monsieur Trudel. Monsieur Blanchette Jancard. Monsieur Blanchette Jancard. Madame Bérubé. Madame Bérubé. Monsieur Désilet. Monsieur Désilet. Ms. May Sandwich Gulf Islands. Ms. May Sandwich Gulf Islands. Mr. Morris. Mr. Vong. Que tout ce que. All those opposed to the motion will please rise. Holland. Mr. Holland. Mr. Sajan. Mr. Sajan. Mr. Blair. Mr. Blair. Mr. O'Regan. Mr. O'Regan. Ms. Bennett. Ms. Bennett. Mr. Duclos. Mr. Duclos. Mr. Rodriguez. Mr. Rodriguez. Mr. Leblanc. Mr. Leblanc. Mr. Champagne. Mr. Champagne. Ms. Anon. Ms. Anon. Mr. Algabra. Mr. Algabra. Mr. Wilkinson. Mr. Wilkinson. Ms. Tassie. Ms. Tassie. Madame Fitzpatrick Taylor. Madame Fitzpatrick Taylor. Mr. Housefather. Mr. Housefather. Ms. Chager. Ms. Chager. Mr. McKay. Mr. McKay. Ms. Scrow. Ms. Scrow. Mr. Scarpelagia. Mr. Scarpelagia. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey. Madame Saint-Onge. Saint-Onge. Ms. Cara. Ms. Cara. Mr. Vandal. Mr. Vandal. Ms. Murray. Ms. Murray. Ms. Gould. Ms. Gould. Mr. McKinnon Gatineau. Mr. McKinnon Gatineau. Ms. Ng. Ms. Ng. Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller. Mr. Mendicino. Mr. Mendicino. Madame Le Boutillier. Madame Le Boutillier. Madame Bibo. Madame Bibo. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Madame Bendayan. Madame Bendayan. Mr. Serry. Mr. Serry. Mr. Dollywall. Mr. Dollywall. Mr. Arsenault. Mr. Arsenault. Ms. Vandenbell. Ms. Vandenbell. Mr. Sanson. Mr. Sanson. Madame Briere. Madame Briere. Mr. Biddle. Mr. Biddle. Mr. Fillmore. Mr. Fillmore. Mrs. Romanato. Mrs. Romanato. Mr. Lamoureux. Mr. Lamoureux. Ms. Sahota. Ms. Sahota. Mr. Verani. Mr. Verani. Mr. Fergus. Mr. Fergus. Mr. Ananda Sangri. Mr. Ananda Sangri. Madame Koutrakis. Madame Koutrakis. Ms. De Brusson. Ms. De Brusson. Mr. Lozon. Mr. Lozon. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Dillon. Ms. Dillon. Mr. Assassi. Mr. Assassi. Mr. El Khoury. Mr. El Khoury. Mr. Fonseca. Mr. Fonseca. Mr. Fisher. Mr. Fisher. Mr. Kuzmerchek. Mr. Kuzmerchek. Ms. O'Connell. Ms. O'Connell. Mr. Kellaway. Mr. Kellaway. Ms. Sachs. Ms. Sachs. Mr. May Cambridge. Mr. May Cambridge. Ms. Suds. Ms. Suds. Mr. Badaway. Mr. Badaway. Mr. Batiste. Mr. Batiste. Mr. Fragascados. Mr. Fragascados. Mr. Long. Mr. Long. Mr. Longfield. Mr. Longfield. Mr. Maloney. Mr. Maloney. Mr. McDonald Avalon. Mr. McDonald Avalon. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Morrissey. Mr. Morrissey. Mr. Sarai. Mr. Sarai. Mr. Shifke. Mr. Shifke. 
Madam Shanahan. Ms. Sidhu Brampton South. Ms. Sidhu Brampton South. Mr. Sarbera. Mr. Sarbera. Mrs. Zaid. Mrs. Zaid. Ms. Yip. Ms. Yip. Mr. Aldag. Mr. Aldag. Mrs. Atwin. Mrs. Atwin. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Mr. Van Bynen. Mr. Van Bynen. Madame Mendez. Madame Mendez. Mr. Zuberi. Mr. Zuberi. Mr. Chahal. Mr. Chahal. Mr. Collins, Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Mr. Collins, Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Madame Diab. Madame Diab. Mr. Gahir. Mr. Gahir. Mr. Hanley. Mr. Ham Hamley. Ms. Hefner. Ms. Hefner. Ms. Kayabaga. Ms. Kayabaga. Madame Lapointe. Madame Lapointe. Mr. McDonald Malpec. Mr. McDonald Malpec. Mr. Miao. Mr. Miao. Mr. Noor Mohammed. Mr. Noor Mohammed. Ms. Taylor Roy. Ms. Taylor Roy. Mrs. Valdez. Mrs. Valdez. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Julian. Mr. Julian. Ms. Kwan. Ms. Kwan. Mr. Garrison. Mr. Garrison. Mr. Backrack. Mr. Backrack. Ms. Idlout. Ms. Idlout. Mr. Canning. Mr. Cannings. Mr. Johns. Mr. Johns. Mr. Angus. Mr. Angus. Mr. Davies. Mr. Davies. Ms. Matheson. Ms. Matheson. Mr. Dujarle. Mr. Dujarle. Ms. McPherson. Ms. McPherson. Mr. Blakey. Mr. Blakey. The House will now wait for the electronic voting period to end before resuming proceedings.